I got it. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to the Dog State College and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College Friendly Debate Competition. My name is Jessia James, and I will be your mistress of ceremonies. Please let us stand as we begin this morning's proceedings with the national anthems of the participating territories. Let us stand to sing the national anthem of Dominica. Let us join in singing the national anthem of St. Lucia. We now welcome Mr. Jim Joseph, Managing Director of MAP and IT Solutions with the opening prayer. Good morning, please stand. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the creator of all things, God of wisdom and knowledge, understanding. We thank you for this opportunity today to be able to come here as a people. We thank you for those who have prepared and we thank you for those who have uh, provided the guidance uh, for this debate to take place. We ask for your wisdom today. We pray that not only will it be an exercise, but also it will be something that we can glean knowledge from, especially as this transi transitional stage in our development where we need guidance and wisdom. So we pray for your intervention, for your wisdom. We pray for um, wisdom for the judges, that they will come up with a fair decision. And we pray, Father, that will be a wonderful exercise that we can benefit from it individually and also uh, as a nation. So we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mr. Jim Joseph, please be seated. Mr. Jim Joseph, Managing Director of MAP and IT Solutions. Mrs. Tracy Pilgrim George, Senior Advancement Office Officer at the South Lewis Community College. Dominica Society Coordinators, Dominica State College. South Lewis Community College, 
Our moderator, Mr. Ryan Augustine Joseph, judges, debaters, faculty, staff, and students at the Dominica State College and the South Lewis Community College. Specially invited guests, online viewers, I bid you all a pleasant morning. It is with great excitement that we welcome the participating colleges, the Dominica State College, and of course, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College to our friendly debate. I now invite to the podium with the opening remarks, Senior Advancement Officer at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, Mrs. Tracy Pilgrim George. Thank you, Madam MC, and good morning. Please allow me to adopt the protocol that has already been established. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed guests, faculty members, and esteemed participants from Dominica State College and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, I would like to welcome you all to this exciting, friendly debate. Good morning. Firstly, let me express my gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us. Today marks a special occasion as we witness the intellectual prowess, powers, and eloquence of the students from these two esteemed institutions. Debate, as we know, is not just about arguments and opposing viewpoints. It is a platform where ideas clash, where perspectives are challenged, and where minds are expanded. It is through such events that we cultivate critical thinking, effective communication, and a deeper understanding of the world around us. This competition is a testament of the commitment of Dominica State College and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College to foster academic excellence and nurture the leaders of tomorrow. These institutions have prepared their students, equipping them with knowledge, research skills, and the ability to articulate their thoughts effectively. Today we gather not merely to witness a contest, but to celebrate the spirit of healthy competition and camaraderie. As the participants take the stage, let us remember that this event is not about winning or losing, or is it? <laughs> what say you, Dominica State? It's about winning SL SALCC? Of course it is. However, I believe that it is more about showcasing the power of informed discourse, the beauty of persuasive arguments, and the respect we hold for diverse opinions. I encourage our debaters to engage in constructive dialogue, to challenge each other's ideas with grace and courtesy, and to remember that the true victory lies in the exchange of ideas and the pursuit of knowledge. To the participants, I offer my heartfelt congratulations to you all. Your hard work, dedication, and passion for debate are commendable. I urge you to embrace this opportunity, make the most of it, and inspire us all with your thought-provoking arguments. Finally, I extend my deepest gratitude to the organizing committee, the faculty members, and all those who have worked tirelessly to ensure that this event is a success. Your commitment to providing a platform for intellectual growth and academic engagement is truly commendable. With that, I welcome you all once again to this friendly debate competition between Dominica State College and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. May this event be filled with insightful discussion, camaraderie, and lasting memories. Best of luck to all our debaters, and may the best woman, man, team win. Let us give Mrs. George another round of applause for her incredible welcome remarks. 
I now welcome debate society coordinators, Ms. Christian of the Dominica State College and Ms. Jacobs of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College with some special remarks. Good morning. I bring you warm greetings from the Nature Isle of the Caribbean and I dare say of the world, Dominica. <laughs> it is indeed a pleasure to be back here in St. Lucia to engage in debate, friendly debate, we say, with the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College Debate Society. Of course, we are friends, but debate rivals, having met each other multiple times in the Windward Islands debating competition over the past few years. It is a pleasure that despite the inability to host or to have the WIDC this year, that we were still able to put together this debate to give our students the ability to have this intercollegiate experience and to get this regional experience that will greatly benefit them moving forward. So as I always implore the students, bring the energy, bring the passion, bring the drive, bring your best side forward, the best arguments that you can put forward, and may the most or the best team win. And I'm glancing at my team because <laughs> I hope that will be them. So debaters, do enjoy this experience. I know it is one that you all have been looking forward to. And I, as the debate coach and the organizer, have been looking forward to it as well. I, I also want to just call out Ms. Lorima Jacobs, um, debate coach, my, my opposing debate coach, but good friend. And you know we've enjoyed camaraderie over the years so so we're smiling at each other now but we're ready to to to, to rumble in a bit right so thank you and i'd like to welcome or invite everyone who has never been to the nature isle to take that opportunity hopefully to attend the debates right at the dominica state college so good luck to both teams Team Dominica, Team Dominica, <laughs> welcome. Um, team, Se I, I thought I would, you'd be more spirited. Hey, do something like that. Team St. Lucia. <laughs> okay, I just want you to know that I am so proud of you. I'm really proud of you. Um, we have some people here. Well, Dominica State College, you do both only ADs right now. That's what you do, associate degrees? You're right, but we also, apart from ADs at SALCC, we also do CAPE. So we have students who just probably finished CAPE about maybe eight or nine days ago, so you can imagine the pressure that they've been under. But I am so proud of both teams. I know that you are anticipating competition, that some of you already know each other, you know, which is really good. And this is what um, this competition is all about, you know, in the interest of um, CARICOM, of integration, you know, of um, OECS unity, CARICOM unity, this is what this competition is all about. So we can engage in healthy discourse, you know, and, and show everyone that um, this is not only about gang culture in our region. You understand that we know how to fight, we know how to battle, we know how through discourse, you understand? And not about us being terrified, afraid, or, but embracing as well as being aware of the concerns regarding AI, you understand? So I want to say that yesterday evening I prayed because I was thinking of seven brave souls on the water. Our Dominican team, they came by boat, despite the weather, despite the time of year, um, the hurricane season, and this is testimony to the spirit of Dominicans, you understand? And I want to, in particular, commend my comrade, Trudy Christian. I mean, Trudy Christian is, is um, WIDC of, of, of Dominica. She's coach coordinator, she's everything, she's entire committee. 
And I want to say this was through this brainchild that we should have this event. Okay? It was a brainchild as well as um, she was the one who began the coordination, etc., and got us involved. And truly, I want to commend you. I am so motivated by you and impressed by you. This is what it's all about. Okay, so for my sistering or brethren, or however we may put it, I don't want to be sexist, Miss Trudy Christian, and Team Dominica, as well as Team St. Lucia, we are ready for competition. Okay? All right. And thank you. Thank you, Debate Society Coordinators, Ms. Christian of the Dominica State College and Ms. Jacobs of the Saapaloni Sa Community College with your wonderful remarks. Thank you very much. So it is now time to meet our debaters for this morning. From the Dominica State College, we have Ajani Schillingford. Let's give a round of applause for him. We have Alicia Bijou Desiree. And we have Mr. Kalil South. Let's go. Round of applause. And now we're going to meet our team from the Saapa Lewis Community College. Yes, who? <laughs> Mr. John Tench, give us a wave. <laughs> Mr. Jaden LeBron. And of course, Mr. Rinkage King. Okay. So now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator and the judges for this year's debate. So our moderator, if you could give us a wave, Mr. Rhyme Ron Augustine Joseph, is a visionary, youth leader, advocate, public speaker and debater who was recently selected for the Gavi and Kuma Legal Fellowship, which provides legal training and opportunities for students from Africa, America, and the Caribbean in legal areas where black people are severely underrepresented. We're going to introduce our judges now. Mr. Yes, yeah, so let's welcome Mr. Raheem Gustin Joseph. Good. Good morning. Oh, I thought it was night for a moment there. Eh? In my previous life, I probably would have been standing at the the middle podium, but I've taken, as I told the judges last night, a more bureaucratic role, which is the highest form of public service. And to that extent, I want to welcome you all to the beautiful island of St. Lucia, only country in the world named after women. And of course, we deal in doubles here. So two Nobel laureates, among many other doubles. So I want to thank the organizers for having me as the moderator today, and I have but the easiest task this morning, which is ready to read, and let's hope that I still remember how to read um, some of the, the judges' information. So Lethan Khan is our first judge, the graduate of the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, where he earned a bachelor's degree in management studies. He is professionally qualified as an associate of the Chartered Institute of London and carries the title of Chartered Insurance Practitioner. He also holds the title of Chartered Director from the Caribbean Governance Training Institute. He is currently actively retired for the past five years after a very long career of over 33 years of insurance sector across the Caribbean, including Jamaica, Trinidad and St. Lucia. He is the former managing director, CEO, and country head of three major insurance organizations in St. Lucia. And he now spends much of his spare time engaged in voluntary service to various groups and organizations 
as well as at the community level. He has been a member of the Rotary Club of St. Lucia for the past 28 years. He has served as a president twice, in 2001 and again in 2020. Over the past two years, he has served as the assistant governor for the Rotary International in St. Lucia District 7030. He lists art, photography, music, chess, international travel, and humanitarian causes as a few of his many interests. Let's put our hand together for Mr. Khan. Dr. Melissa Irvin. Dr. Melissa Irvin is a linguist currently based in St. Lucia. Her research primarily lies in language variation and documentation, and she also has a keen interest in language advocacy. She has lectured at both the undergraduate and postgraduate level, and is currently freelancing as a consultant and an editor. So everyone, if you need to be able to do consultancy services, you know where to go. That's a very important plug. She has also recently been involved in national language policy planning in St. Lucia, along with a number of cultural and linguistic preservation projects. Let's put our hand together for Dr. Irvin. Mr. Jerry George, who needs no introduction. <laughs> Mr. Jerry George is currently an adjunct instructor of media at the Saffa Lewis Community College. He has taught media and communication subjects for over 20 years at various institutions and levels in St. Lucia. He holds qualifications from the UWI, Mona Campus, and the City University of New York, and the BBC Radio Production Training Center in London. He is a certified trainer through the UWI Cavill Campus School of Business, and he is no stranger, obviously, to the public space, to the debating space, to the media space, and all spaces where Jerry finds it necessary to be in. Let's thank Mr. Jerry George by way of coming. Equally, Ms. Tiana Foster requires no introduction, but Tiana Foster is an attorney at law at Foster's and the deputy chair of the Youth Economy Agency. And if I am to say the Youth Economy Agency is focused on expanding initiatives for young people in entrepreneurship and ensuring that young people have access to financing for their respective careers. So I just think that at any opportunity I get, I have to make the point of avenues for young people. She's a member of the Council of the Bar Association of St. Lucia. She is the representative of St. Lucia on the Young Commonwealth Lawyers Association and also the owner of Tiana Fitness Inc. So you know where to go tonight. <laughs> I'll send you the fee structure soon. She's an alumna of the Safa Lewis Community College, having graduated the college in 2017 and was adjudicated the valedictorian of her graduating class. She was recognized for outstanding academic achievement and the top performing student in the subjects of economics and Spanish. She went on to pursue an LLB at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom. Let's put our hand together for Ms. Foster. <laughs> Ms. Lily Ching Soto is a Costa Rican attorney, studied international relations, and obtained her law degree at the University of Costa Rica, and earned her master's degree in international human rights law at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. She has over 20 years of experience at the Organization of the American States, the OAS, and currently, Mistress Ching Soto is the resident representative of the OAS in St. Lucia, Let's put our hands together for Ms. Soto. And last, but by no means least equally, who does not deserve any, any type of introduction because you know him all too well, Mr. Levy Herald, who is an attorney at law with somewhat, that's what he says, of a specialist practice in com company, commercial banking, property, and litigation. 
He has a passion for education and often advises on matters of education and the law. He has served on several boards, including being the chairman of the board of his and my alma mater, the St. Mary's College. I, I didn't hear the clap and applause for that. Yeah. When I was speaking about St. Lucia being the double, I forgot to mention to you that St. Mary's College is equally the double in the Nobel laureates, and it, it's called the Caribbean Laureate School, but that's for a separate show. I want to welcome the president of the vice, the, the principal, Dr. Merle St. Clair Ogis, who has joined us here. Thank you very much, Dr. Ogis. So thank you, judges, and if I may, and you'd forgive me for the purposes of the online audience and the in-person audience to share some of the, the breakdown of the criteria for this debate competition or friendly debate with you today. So the debate structure will be two debates for the day, and of course the topics for these debates are as, as follows. The first one being that the benefit of artificial intelligence outweigh the potential risk to humanity. And the second debate after the break will be that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. Of course, if you look on your program towards the bottom, you will see this explicitly written, and I know that they've given you the free blank space at the back for you to jot down your own notes. But note, this is not Calypso, so don't write your winner at the back. Yeah? <laughs> The judge's decision will be, will be final in this instance. So the breakdown of the criteria for the substantive presentations will be soundness of points, logical development, audibility and clarity, posture and personality, and command of material. And of course, the rebuttal, team coordination, general analysis of the debate, recalling of points, ability to refute points, and spontaneity and the individuals and the team who are best able to amass the most points from these criteria that I've mentioned today will be adjudicated as the winner. Of course, it's very important in this line of work to make your bias clear. And therefore, if St. Lucia does not win, it will be called a friendly debate. And if St. Lucia won or wins, then it is not a friendly debate, but it's a debate of very stiff rivalry. So, I'm not sure if the teams have, I know back in my days in 2018, <laughs> that we used to dip and uh, flip a coin for the proposition and the opposition. I'm not sure that, so that has been done already? Yes. So who will be the, so St. Lucia will be the proposing team. So the first topic for the morning is the benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the potential risk to humanity. Now colleagues, Friends all, in closing, I want to share a very, very short story with you. There was this very fast bowler, I don't remember his name, who ran up to the wicket and of course in great amount of courage and happiness, he bowled to a famous Gordon Greenwich and he had him plumb LBW on the, on the wicket and he appealed and appealed and appealed and appealed. And of course, the empire said not out, and he wondered why. That's before the, the, tele, the technology in cricket came alive. And the empire told him very simply that you think we came here to see you bowl or to see Gordon Greenwich bat. And to that extent, I, am very, I know that you did not come here to hear me speak, but instead you came here to hear the debaters debate. So I will invite the proposition team from the Saafa Lewis Community College to propose the topic that the Benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the potential risk to humanity. Let's welcome this afternoon's community college.
the sin. Ignorance is the parent of fear. A quote by Herman Melville. As humans, we often fear technology because we're not familiar with it. Just like in the previous stages of the Industrial Revolution, there were fears. There were fears of steam engines, the automobile, the telephone, electricity, the personal computer, and even the now widely used smartphone. These innovations caused disruptions to our ways of life, but brought with them tremendous benefits. In today's time, the fear is artificial intelligence. Mr. Moderator, judges, my worthy opponents, and my esteemed audience, I bid you a pleasant good morning. We, the proposition, support the moot. The benefits of AI outweigh the potential risks to humanity. Mr. Moderator, the opposition will try to stoke your fears of all the potential risks of AI. Now, don't get me wrong, there are risks. However, just like its technological predecessors, the good that AI will do far outweighs the bad that it may do. I will support this claim by focusing on three points. One, AI technology will save millions of lives through its use in the medical field. Two, AI will improve the efficiency of the private and public sector for both large companies and the everyday vendor. And three, AI is the only protection we have against the risks of AI. But before we delve into these points, let me define AI. According to the Oxford Dictionary, artificial intelligence or AI is the capacity of computers or other machines to exhibit or simulate intelligent behavior. In addition, artificial intelligence can be classified into three categories, narrow AI, AGI, and ASI. Narrow AI, which is what is prevalent in our current society, is any AI that can outperform a human in a narrowly defined and structured task. For example, software you may be very familiar with, such as Siri or Alexa, self-driving vehicles or image recognition, which is found on platforms like Google or Facebook. Artificial General Intelligence, or AGI, is artificial intelligence which is able to accomplish any intellectual task that human beings could perform in a matter which is equivalent or better. Artificial Super Intelligence, or ASI, is where we start getting into science fiction territory. It is basically a scene out of Terminator, where the AI takes over everything. Current AI technology is nowhere near this. To quote Richard Socher, a former chief scientist at Salesforce, AI is a complex field, and I am the first to say that we computer scientists have not progressed as far as many people believe. For instance, we currently have no credible research path to any kind of conscious AI algorithm, and there are no robots that are truly autonomous or able to make their own decisions. So don't worry about any walking terminators. So, now that we have a little AI 101, let's look at the benefits. By a show of hands, how many of us, now try not to get frustrated right now, how many of us have gotten a bad diagnosis from a doctor before? The doctor tells you that you have so and so illness and you have to buy X, Y, and Z. Afterwards, you still don't feel any better and when you go to another doctor, they tell you, Oh no, you actually have this other bad disease. Annoying, isn't it? The use of AI cuts down on this misdiagnosis and increases the likelihood of detecting diseases early. According to an in-depth report titled Artificial Intelligence in Disease Diagnosis, a Systematic Literature Review, Synthesizing Framework and Future Research Agenda. AI currently can be used to diagnose cancer. 
cardiovascular disease, hypertension, neurological abnormalities, tuberculosis, skin and liver disease, as well as musculoskeletal injuries with high accuracy. When it comes to saving a life, every second counts. AI gives us those extra seconds so that someone doesn't have to say, if only we saw it earlier. The benefits of AI are so diverse that they even branch out into the business sector. So perhaps do we have any entrepreneurs, business people, or side hustlers in the room? How about any employees of the public sector? AI benefits you as well. It is revolutionizing industries and enhancing efficiency and productivity. NI Business Info lists some benefits of AI, those being saving time and money. Money. By automating and optimizing routine processes and tasks, increasing productivity and operational efficiencies, and avoiding mistakes and human error, provided that AI systems are set up properly. These are only a few of the benefits listed, which are further substantiated by some statistics provided by Forbes. Over 60% of business owners believe AI will increase productivity. Specifically, 64% stated that AI would improve business productivity, and 42% believe it will streamline job processes. This doesn't just apply to the large companies like the Facebooks and Amazons of the world, but also our very own Saturday vendors by the market and the neighborhood farmers. Budgeting and accounting, which may be tedious for the grandmother selling mangoes on a Saturday morning, can be enhanced and completed quickly with AI. For the farmer, AI can help him decide what is the best layout of crops to grow on his land, taking into account our climate and potential damage from hurricanes. Especially now that we are in the hurricane season, our opponents, being from the nature aisle, would surely appreciate the value in this. Sticking on our opponents, they may try to bombard you with frightening quotes from persons in the AI industry, including Jeffrey Hinton, a.k.a. the godfather of AI. Quote, unquote, we know that a lot of people who want to use these tools are bad actors like Putin or DeSantis. They want to use them for winning wars or manipulating electorates. But he also points out that he is not fearful of AI development itself, but of the bad actors who could use it. And to his credit, this is an understandable fear. But the reality is that AI technology will continue to develop. So the only way to combat bad actors of AI is to use AI. The internet brought with it computer viruses. To beat it, we repurposed the software used in those viruses to create antivirus protection. We will do the same with AI. To protect your nenen from getting scammed by persons using AI, and we know it can happen, our poor nenen, our devices will have AI agents and scripts which will look for vulnerabilities and also provide defenses against other AI attacks. This can even be scaled to financial institutions, private sector industries, government, and regional agencies. At the end of the day, AI is our only safeguard against the risks of AI. Mr. Moderator, most of the fears of AI are really fears of our own insecurity or our capacity to do evil. But as the writer Stephen Plavina put it, fear is not the enemy. It is a compass pointing you to the areas where you need to grow. However, in an effort to minimize fears about these bad actors, currently there is a draft EU artificial intelligence policy being discussed within the member states, but my colleague will further elaborate on this. In the meantime, AI is improving lives in health, business, security, and several other aspects of life. Its benefits 
far outweigh the risks. I look forward to how we humans continue to use AI to improve our lives. Because at the end of the day, technology is and always will be secondary to the irreplaceable human soul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for I will give the judges a few seconds or minutes to tally their, their scores. You know, of course, we want to give them all the time that they require. Right, Omar? So in the meantime, you can spend the opportunity writing your own thoughts and prayers in some instances <laughs> on the back of your program paper on the particular topic. I must tell you that the leader of the proposition had 10 minutes to speak. I probably should have told you that before. And the leader of the opposition equally has 10 minutes. And then the seconders have 7 minutes respectively. If it is anything like my previous life, then the rebuttal will be for a maximum of five minutes. Note that the conditions stipulate that debaters are not to introduce any new information in the rebuttal. So do not use the opportunity to slide something because I will realize and I will report to you. Judges, we ready? Yes? Consensus? Okay, I see, I see Mr. George working assiduously. I also must tell you that in the recent past, we've had many, many fancy ideas about what regional integration means. But in its most real sense, we have two Jamaican judges here with us today. And that, I want you to put your hands together for that because in a very real way, these, these are the practical elements of what regional integration means. And equally, I know my Dominican colleagues did not have to travel with their passport, whether it was expired or not, because you could travel with your OEC, well, your ID card from your respective country within the OECS. These are the regional integration initiatives that we speak about. But I want to, now that the judges are, are done, I want to welcome the opposition leader, Mr. Ajani Shillingford, who will make his presentation for 10 minutes before us today. Let's welcome him. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to St. Lucia, where technology surpasses nature. Jump into your AI Uber. Snap once to be catapulted to the peak of the famous pitons. Snap twice to be instantly submarine to the underwater world. Snap thrice to just hang out at the best AI-assisted resort in the Western Hemisphere. I am Alex, your electronic AI tour guide at your service 24-7. Mr. Moderator, honorable judges, my esteemed colleague, my worthy opponents, teammates, technical staff, listening audience and media, good morning. The scenario presented sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Sadly, with the rapid advancement of artificial intelligence, science fiction is becoming our reality. It is with great passion and conviction that I stand before you here today, along with my respected colleague, to present our case in opposition to the moot, the benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the potential risks to humanity. 
We are in total agreement that there are many advantages to artificial intelligence. That is not what is being debated here today. The question is, are those benefits worth the potential risks to humanity? We say no. We affirm in unequivocal terms that the risks and dangers of artificial intelligence far surpass the risks to humanity. The benefits to humanity, I apologize. Once we have presented our irrefutable arguments, I have no doubt that each one of you human beings here today will support our stance. Mr. Moderator, Honorable Judges, allow me to provide some clarification to the moot at hand. The Oxford English Dictionary provides the following definitions. A benefit is an advantage or profit gained from something. A risk is a situation involving exposure to danger. The verb to outweigh is defined as to be heavier, greater, or more significant than. And the word potential is defined as having or showing the capacity to develop into something in the future. Now, for the big question, what exactly is artificial intelligence? Again, according to the reliable Oxford Dictionary, artificial intelligence or AI is the study and development of computer systems that can copy intelligent human behavior. Mr. Moderator, honorable judges, throughout my argument, I will prove the following points substantiated by evidence. First and foremost, the dependence on artificial intelligence diminishes human intelligence. Secondly, artificial intelligence will lead to a loss of human connection. And finally, AI development leads to multiple international security concerns and risks to our planet. Mr. Moderator, allow me to sound the alarm. While the initial objective was to develop AI to match human intelligence, it has been predicted by many highly reputed top technologists that by the year 2045, AI would have surpassed human intelligence. According to a 2019 report by U.S. Stanford University, and I quote, every three months, the speed of artificial intelligence computation doubles. Here lies the problem. AI is becoming more intelligent than humans. And when the creation outsmarts the creator, the creator will be defeated. One of the most compelling reasons why artificial poses a threat to humanity is the fact that the dependence on artificial intelligence diminishes human intelligence. The saying that practice makes perfect has no relevance in an AI-driven world as AI replaces every exercise that would allow the brain to maximize its potential. No need to study basic geography. Ask Siri. No need to learn a foreign language. Ask Alexa. This over-reliance on AI systems will no doubt lead to a loss of creativity, human intuition, and critical thinking skills. Future generations will not possess the human cognitive abilities of yesteryear. Mr. Moderator, according to American business magazine, Inc.com, a 2023 university at Albany study of 78 primary care physicians showed that, and I quote, AI software diminished doctors' ability to make informed decisions about diagnosis and treatment, end of quote. Why? Because even doctors have become so reliant on AI that in the absence of this assisted intelligence, their brains are no longer tuned to operate independently. Mr. Moderator, while humans seek to develop more intelligent AI, the human species is losing their own intelligence. We must be aware when the creation outsmarts the creator, the creator will be defeated. Mr. Moderator, another very alarming point in opposition to the moot is the fact that an increased reliance on AI-driven communication will lead to a loss of human connection. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, besides food, water, and safety, Love and belonging are the most important needs we must fulfill as human beings. This includes our desire for interpersonal relationships, intimacy, to connect with others, to build empathy and social skills, 
and to be integrated into a group. We are greeted by AI in classrooms, in restaurants, in airports, even taxis are AI driven today. What will this mean, my most distinguished opponents, for the human interaction we absolutely require? The me to you, eye to eye human connection that can be so therapeutic on a day to day basis. In places like Dominica and St. Lucia, where the warmth and friendliness of the people was once a significant component of our identity, alas, the once upon a time Helen of the West will become the Alexa of the West. Mr. Moderator, artificial intelligence is not just taking over our business places, it's taking over our homes, and robots are already on the market creeping into our, um, into our marital beds. According to the British Guardian newspaper, in 2022, Bed Bible, a sex toy review site, published a study that claimed, and I quote, 56,000 sex robots are sold per year worldwide among an adult population for around 5 billion, end of quote. Robots in our beds, Madam Moderator, Magwesa, you can oublie Papa Bondier. Honorable judges, hear my cry. When the creation outsmarts the creator, the creator will be defeated. Mr. Moderator, as my worthy opponents boast the merit of artificial intelligence, let us bear in mind that AI is not restricted to any one nation or group of nations. Any government, organization, or group can pursue the development of AI as long as they have the financial resources to do so. And that includes rogue foreign powers and terrorist organizations. According to the United Nations, AI weaponry are, and I quote, weapons that locate, select, and engage human targets without human supervision, end of quote. In addition to the physical AI weapons, there is the immense risk of weaponized information, lies, and propaganda dangerously destabilizing human groups. Cyber crim criminals can reach into economic systems and exploit their vulnerabilities. With AI-driven weapons of mass destruction in the wrong hands, not only is their purpose a threat to humanity, but considering the fact that in the event of war, critical decision-making processes would be in the hands of literally heartless machines, the result can be nothing but apocalyptic. Mr. Moderator, we have no control over foreign powers. With AI weaponry in the wrong hands, our safety as human inhabitants on this planet is at risk. My attentive audience, according to the highly reputed online economic review, Forbes.com, in March 2023, more than 1,000 researchers and technologists signed a letter calling for a six-month pause on AI development because they said, and I quote, it poses profound risks to society and humanity, end of quote. While my opponents bask in the euphoria of the exciting advancement of AI, let us pay heed to this unprecedented mass resignation of top world technologists. If my opponents were to have their way, very soon, for the first time in four billion years, the human species would not be the most intelligent species on planet Earth. If my opponents were to have their way within the next decade, intellectual debates such as this friendly debate held today would be between the best AI from Dominica against the best AI of St. Lucia. If my opponents were to have their way, Mr. Moderator, artificial intelligence would be the very last invention of the human species. Mr. Moderator, honorable judges, lest we forget, when the creation outsmarts the creator, the creator will be defeated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominica. We could give another round of applause for <laughs> the, the Dominica State College. Wow.
Alexa from the West. Would you imagine that, eh? So again, I invite you to continue making your notes. If I knew that there would be lapses within uh, the time, or rather if I remembered that there would, would be the lapses within the time I would have prepared, or brought with me rather my book of jokes that I normally carry around that I give, you know, but I don't know that this audience has the financial capabilities to patronize me for my jokes. <laughs> so I possibly will consider for the next time. But the judges, thank you very much, Mr. Shillingford, for your very spirited debate. And as I mentioned earlier, these are the moments and the initiatives within our reintegration movement that gives life to the movement. So, of course, once the leaders are looking these are the things that need to guide their inspiration and guide the motivation across free movement, movement of good services people, among many other freedoms within our regional integration movement. It is my belief that the judges are soon concluding this part, and then we will go to St. Lucia's seconder, which has, which has seven minutes to make his presentation. Debaters, just be reminded that at the end of your 10 minute presentation, you have only, only 10 seconds to conclude and any time spent beyond that. In my days, I think the judges would tune off and no longer take you on and start judging from the 10 minute mark, 10 minutes and 10 seconds. Omar. So tonight, Dominica State College, um, you are invited to the Soka Monarch Finals. Just get to the gate and say Rhyme sent you. <laughs> I'm not sure you might get past there, but the music is loud enough that you can listen from the outside. So I invite the, the audience and the viewers online to patronize St. Lucia's Carnival. Nothing sweeter than that. Um, the Soka Monarch is tonight, and tomorrow is the Calypso Finals. Again, I always like to bring my biases with me, so no one ever attempts to say that I'm objective. I, I don't claim to be. Very, very subjective. But I will be supporting the, the reigning monarch, whoever that is, at the Calypso Monarch Finals tomorrow. In true Sumerian spirit, you know? Right, you see, is that no Mr. Harold will always support me on these type of things. But I think the judges are ready. And we'll go to St. Arthur Lewis Community College, seconder for the proposition side of this debate, Mr. Jaden LeBron. Let's put our hands together for Mr. LeBron. Mr. Moderator, have you ever, say, been on social media, got lost and had to use Google Maps or, I don't know, travel to St. Lucia for a debate competition? Perhaps, chances are, you have been a beneficiary of artificial technology. And instead of being scared, you've enjoyed the convenience. Now, my friends here believe that the risks of AI are noteworthy. And we, the proposition, agree with that notion. But does that mean we are forced into a for or against stance with AI? Please, let us not be polarized with our thinking. To echo my brilliant proposition leader, we firmly propose that the benefits of artificial intelligence outweighs the potential risks to humanity. In my presentation, I'll be focusing on two points. One, AI will lead to more jobs, higher efficiency, and greater workplace safety. And two, AI will close gaps in the education system by making topics more digestible for students. Mr. Moderator, with any new technology, one of the main concerns is always, will this take my job? Our opponents expeditiously insisted upon the potential for AI to disrupt the labor force. But 
This is not a new argument. In May 2023, the Challenger Report of Laos found that of US-based employers, 3,900 cuts were attributed to artificial intelligence. However, AI contributed to less than 5% of total labor cuts collected in this study. Baffling, is this not? Just like its technological predecessors, AI still needs the human factor. To quote the World Economic Forum in 2023, people will be at the heart of successful AI use. Another quote from the Vulcan Post, a digital publication, elaborates on this further. They state that, throughout different eras, from the Industrial Revolution to the digital age, disruptive technologies have indeed displaced certain occupations. However, they have also given rise to entirely new industries, transforming the job market and creating a demand for new skills and expertise. They project that 60%, 60% of workers today are employed in occupations that did not exist in the 1940s, which means that over 85% of employment growth over the past 80 years is attributed to the technology-driven creation of new positions. Mr. Moderator, monotonous tasks can be streamlined while high-risk activities can be left to the machines. Any jobs displaced are made up by new jobs to be created, as has happened in previous industrial revolutions. This gap could be further widened by implementing counter strategies to technological unemployment associated with AI. Unemployment benefits and re-employment assistance could be provided for persons displaced by AI. Upskilling and reskilling programs could also help individuals adapt to changing job requirements. So, now that I've tempered your fears about jobs, some of you might still be thinking, what about the children? Yes, can't students just cheat more instead of actually learning their course material? But I ask you this once more. Is this anything new? When the calculator was invented, for instance, teachers faced the same challenges, but they found a way to integrate it into their classrooms. The same can be said about computers, laptops, smartphones, and tablets. We will create new models of learning to meet those challenges. And with AI, the learning models we can develop are game changing. We can close educational gaps, especially for small island nations like ourselves. A professor struggling to explain a concept to a special needs child can use ChatGPT to get a customized explanation to meet that child's needs. A student who can't afford the education now has access to all the information needed to fulfill his dream job. To combat cheating, policies and regulations and standards are being developed, not only in the classroom, but for all sectors that AI is being used in, especially in security. Recently, in fact, just last month, the European Union and the G7 made progress towards passing law, laws to regulate artificial intelligence, aiming to address security concerns through the implementation of standards, policies, and regulations. To quote the European Commission Vice President and Tech Chief Margaret Vestager, AI is too important not to regulate, and it's too important to regulate badly. A good regulation that we all agree on as soon as possible must be a common objective. Mr. Moderator, judges, in my presentation, I have shown you the phenomenal benefits AI brings to employment and education. The risks, though present, are not beyond the realm of mitigation, and policies, standards, and regulations are on their way. In my moments left with you, I compel you to realize one thing. From the development of the steam engine to the discovery of electricity, from the invention of nuclear power to the advent of the internet, as technology advances, humanity adapts to overcome its challenges. Sure, there may be missteps, but the advantages are of greater magnitude. So please, let us not be polarized in our thinking. By regulating this technology, as we've done before, we can save lives, boost economic growth, develop our potential, and secure a brighter future for humanity. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Mr. LeBron. Let's put our hands together again for Mr. <laughs> Mr. LeBron. I found it quite fascinating, though, that Mr. LeBron was not smiling throughout the entire presentation, but for that moment when he spoke about chat GBT. <laughs> but for these purposes, he's on the right side of the argument, not the wrong side. So again, the topic for your own purposes, that the benefits of artificial intelligence outweighs the potential risk to humanity. And again, as is traditional, during the break, we would have a very, very short share of ideas and views on the topic. And that is why it's imperative that you take your notes throughout the presentation so that you can share your own, your own thoughts. Reminding you also of the criteria for the debate competition today. So you have for the rebuttal, which you will see later on, the points are evenly distributed across areas like team coordination, general analysis of the debate, the ability to recall the points, the ability to refute the points, and also the spontaneity. Additionally, for your prepared presentations, soundness of points, logical development, audibility and clarity, posture and personality, and also command of material. That would give a total of 100, and also the rebuttal, a total of 60. And I know that the debaters have studied these criteria just like in any exam, when you don't particularly only study the material, but you study the marking criteria, and you also in the most psychological way, study the lecturer as well. Because it's good to know that. I see Dr. Fulgens looking at me. No, sir, I did not study you. I studied the work, the material. <laughs> at another time, I'll give you, Dr. Fulgens and I, the running joke of the shock I got when I came out to Arthur Lewis, believing that I'm this bright chap from St. Mary's College who could just write anything. And then he reminded me that this is not how it works. But I figured it out after, after the first semester. But these are the lessons that you need. Judges, I think you may be ready. And I want to introduce to you the opposition seconder from the Dominica State College, Mr. Khalil Stout. Mr. Moderator, Honorable Judges, my capable colleagues, my worthy opponents, members of the audience, good morning. I stand before you today entirely unmoved by my opponents' feeble attempts to propose the moot. My colleagues and I are resolute that the benefits of artificial intelligence, otherwise known as AI, do not outweigh the possible risk to humanity. I will further strengthen our stance by I will further strengthen our stance by proving the following points. Firstly, the broad use of AI technology raises concerns about massive loss of employment. Secondly, the bias and discrimination that AI can perpetuate is a major risk to humanity. And lastly, there are immense privacy threats that AI poses as it advances. Mr. Moderator, the advancement of AI may result in massive unemployment. It is an undeniable fact that as AI continues to advance, more and more tasks previously performed by humans will become automated, leading to a significant displacement of workers. This is according to expert Ahmed Banafa, a former professor from the University of California. If we take a look at history, Mr. Moderator, this is nothing strange. Let's recall, for instance, the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century, which saw the widespread adoption of mechanized production. This led to the displacement of many craftspeople as a result. But, my worthy opponents, the potential risk of advancing AI 
to obliterate human beings' potential livelihoods is at far greater proportions than the Industrial Revolution. My worthy opponents, perhaps you've all been hit with a wave of amnesia and have forgotten the recent COVID-19 pandemic. One which in just the US alone was responsible for over 40 million job losses, according to Alana Samuels, an economic correspondent at time. At the time of the pandemic, Daniel Soskin, a fellow in economics at Balliol College, University of Oxford, noted, this pandemic has created a very strong incentive to automate human beings' work. Machines do not become sick, they do not need to separate themselves from peers, and they do not need to take time off work. A pretty depressing but regrettably accurate flaw that AI simply does not possess. But would you believe, Mr. Moderator, many still claim that although AI may result in unemployment, it will inadvertently produce more jobs in the future? <laughs> well, not to be a boss here, but such a matter is not that straightforward. Allow me, Mr. Moderator, allow me to present to you the views of Goretti Paul, a St. Lucian human resources worker who voiced her concerns on Loop News on May 24, 2023, about AI in her workplace. She stated, and I quote, our talent pool is limited because we have a lot of unemployed people who are not employable at the moment. In this present and future workplace, we, dem we demand a distinct set of talents, particularly in the area of technology. End of quote. If AI creates more employment than it destroys, who is to say that the individuals who lose their jobs will acquire or even have the ability to develop the skills necessary for the new positions? Should we choose to overlook this as some silly overreaction and await the possible ramifications? How disquieting, Mr. Moderator. Now for my second point. If an AI system is biased or discriminating, it might utilize data to reinforce these biases, resulting in unjust and undesirable outcomes for individuals. Consider how, in 2018, big tech major Amazon was forced to abandon an AI recruiting approach it had been developing. This AI system seemed to have a pronounced prejudice towards women. This is because Amazon's computer models were taught to screen candidates over a 10-year span by detecting trends in applications submitted to the business, the majority of which came from males. Mr. Moderator, Amazon's AI technology effectively taught itself that male candidates were preferable. That is right, it taught itself. It punished resumes with the phrase women's, such as women's chess club captain. According to engineers acquainted with the situation at the time, it also demoted, gra it also demoted graduates of two all-women's colleges. Can you imagine, female members of the audience, after spending years of hard work trying to get your future career, a little chess club you decided to join with your girls caused you to be rejected? Hmm. Personally, I wouldn't take that level of disrespect. But, Mr. Moderator, bias and discrimination are the only things. On to my last substantive point, the privacy concerns AI poses. AI may be used to generate convincing phony images and videos that can be used to disseminate disinformation or even sway public opinion. Members of the audience, this false media has recently gained traction and has, and has been known as something known as deepfake, which MIT describes as AI designed to successfully replace one person's image with that of another. President of the United States, Joe Biden, has been a recent victim of this. One such example being just a few months ago when an image of President Biden touching a young boy's pants was posted to social media. Additionally, this deepfake has been used to create false images of the Pope. Yes, not even the Pope is safe. <laughs> the image portrayed the Pope rocking a Balenciaga jacket. Perhaps he was trying to be hip with the kids. If only it was real. However, that is not all, Mr. Moderator. Not only can they steal your image, but they can also take your voice. What else will be stolen, I wonder? This technology is currently being used to compose full songs of prominent artists 
Famous musicians, including Drake, have had songs removed from streaming sites, but were not even created by them. How far will AI technology progress until we can't tell what's real and what's not? How far before we are stripped of our own identity, Mr. Moderator? In conclusion, while my colleague and I understand the great benefits that AI has provided and may continue to provide for humanity, we are confident that the risks AI may impose on us all are far greater. I say this with the understanding that one, employment is threatened by the advancement of AI technology. Two, AI has the potential to perpetuate biases and discrimination, and free our privacy could be potentially stripped away. I believe if we don't take these risks into account for the future, artificial intelligence may possibly be the nail in the coffin to humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stout, let's put our hands together again for Mr. Stout. For clarification, does the preparation for the rebuttal start now or after the judges have stopped and then the, the preparation starts? So the preparation for the rebuttal will start now. Five minutes preparation for the rebuttal while the judges do their thing. So five minutes and you will be timed. And I will not give you the grace of 10 seconds.
preparation for the rebuttal is done, I think the judges are equally or should be equally done as well. So, in our oh, time up, <laughs> I'm not quite sure that was for me, but in our Western type democracy, oppositions have very little say. It wasn't me, it's the product of Westminster, and government has the final say. So in this instance here, it means that the opposition, the Dominica State College, will be the one to start off the rebuttal, and then the proposition or the government will have the final say. And then, of course, the people, the judges. You see, I've just created a beautiful democratic system for you. I've fashioned a new constitutional reform for our, for our region. Yes, but the people, the judges, will have the final say. And I, as Speaker of the House, will declare the winners <laughs> that these are where ideas are created. Don't you agree, gentlemen? Anyway, so the opposition rebuttal will be done by Mr. Ajani Schillenford, who has five minutes. Let's welcome him to the, the stage. Mr. Moderator, Honorable Judges, the evidence has spoken. We are at the dawn of a new age where the human species will soon no longer be the most intelligent species on planet Earth. We have proven that the tremendous and undeniable development of artificial intelligence is not worth the risk to humanity. We have listened attentively to our esteemed opponents. And how ironic, and may I add how sad, that they are saying that despite millions of years of human intelligence that has brought us from the Stone Age to the Industrial Revolution, that we should today bow to this new form of intelligence that we deem superior to us. They are telling the next generation, to the unborn geniuses and trailblazers, that you are just a mere human. Your human intelligence is not good enough. You should not reach for the sky. Let us allow artificial intelligence to lead us into the next century. Shame on you. Firstly, the, my opponents tried to downplay super AI. But that is exactly what we are talking about, the potential risks. We acknowledge that there are benefits. And of course, whatever benefits that we are benefiting from today, we are in control of it, just like the Industrial Revolution. Yes, it was a new change, it was a new opening, but we were in control of it. And with super AI that they try to downplay, we will not be in control of it. The first speaker claimed that AI improves efficiency, it saves time, it is faster, it reduces human error. But the big question is why? Why are we striving to use artificial intelligence to make our lives faster, easier, and quicker, yet at the expense of losing the liberties to enjoy those luxuries? Why? With super AI taking over, we will not even be able to enjoy the fact that AI is faster and, so, and easier to work with. We will not be able to do that. The second speaker claimed that it will produce jobs, it eases the workload, it um, improves, em it creates employment. But, yes, it will create employment, but all those jobs will only be related to AI. What about the person whose only ability, people with disabilities, and they can only stamp labels on a bottle? What about them? What if they lose their own dignity? This is the entire point of the topic, the risk to humanity, and all of that should be taken into consideration when we are talking about humanity. The first speaker also claimed that it would save millions of lives, that it would improve, you know, medicine and that kind of things. But this is very interesting because why on earth would we do that if we cannot even benefit from it? And because as I, early, as I said earlier, it is faster, it is quicker, but we will not even be able to benefit from it because super AI will be taking over. So yes, anyone with cancer can maybe, maybe you know, live longer, but live longer to be pets or slaves to super AI. That is the point. Also, the first speaker agreed that bad actors can use AI. 
And the second speaker also added that good regulation, the common objective of government, is needed. But this is actually really laughable because when or oh when have world leaders ever been able to agree on something? Never, never, ever, ever. And as you guys said, countries can use AI for their own malicious gains in like in war. Artificial intelligence already matches human intelligence. But in the next couple decades, artificial intelligence would surpass human intelligence. Mr. Moderator, we reaffirm our opposition to the moot that the benefits of artificial intelligence do not outweigh the potential risks to humanity for the simple reason being that when the creation outsmarts the creator, the creator will be defeated. Thank you. Invite Mr. John Tench to. Oh, well, the judges have to. <laughs> I was really playing speedy there to catch up with the break, you know? But thank you very much, Mr. Schillingford, right? Yes. From Dominica State College, either. But we'll see an introduction of a new debater. And this is how this new innovative way of this debate has worked. The debate one of the two individuals, more particularly the leader of the two debaters, would be the one to do the rebuttal. But in this instance, with the addition of the third debater, it is my belief that anyone among the three who feels so inclined can be the one to do the rebuttal at the end of the debate. So St. Lucia has included, I don't want to say wild card, because this suggests that he's not prepared, but here they have included the super sub, call him all the way from the bench and give him a specific task that is to do the rebuttal. Judges, you will let me know when you are ready. We could all just have a moment to reflect on which carnival shows we're going to <laughs> this weekend and next week. Remember I told you the, the Soka Monarch is tonight, the carnival, the, the Calypso is tomorrow. I, will, I have Desiree shirts on sale just so that you could patronize the, the crew. Um, and we could see next week, Kalami Red, Euphoria, among many others. Um, family, and I will check the calendar and tell you what else is there. I just sort of gave you what I think I'm going to. Ones that you all have contributed to the fund. So, during the break. I think the judges should be should be ready, and I will now introduce to you Mr. John Tench, who will be the one to deliver this in South Lewis Community College free battle and close the debate. Good morning, good morning. I'd like to start off first by issuing uh, my deepest apologies to the team out from the Dominica State College for traveling such a long way only for the argument to be laid bare by the sheer soundness of ours. Right. And so what we are talking about is the human race on the very cusp of its development and its advancement into the next few centuries. And so the opposition would have you believe that artificial intelligence will diminish human intelligence. However, they have not justified what they mean by that. Human intelligence means what? Does it mean computation? Does it mean emotional intelligence? Does it mean if I get a heartbreak, I can go to artificial intelligence and speak to them about that or my mother? They have not justified that. And so artificial intelligence does not mean sentience, as my colleagues have said. And so the opposition's pantomime, when they started with the little gesture, does not stand. So rather, artificial intelligence makes the human capacity increased. What does that mean? So we came from 
using mainly textbooks and encyclopedias to using the internet. And so what now do we say? Do we, do we look back a few centuries later and say, well, students are now using textbooks, that is not good, they're not, they're not efficient, send them and do their own research. No. Further, they lamented the human connection. But I will disagree. This proposition strongly disagrees because with artificial intelligence handling the more menial tasks, we have more time to go to the beach and to relax and speak to our friends. And after the carnage that was the COVID-19 pandemic, we know now more than ever, we value human connection. I do not think it will, we will ever get to the point as a human race where, we'll, where we will not interact with our fellow human beings. So yes, moving on, artificial intelligence will cause a loss of jobs. But what jobs, what types of jobs? Dominica State College, the opposition has failed to add the nuance to the conversation. Are, they, are we losing skilled labor or unskilled labor? Are we losing people who are filing or are we, as the human race, forcing and encouraging the development of our minds in ways that we have never seen? So now a young man and a young woman from the Caribbean can aspire to be more than just a call center attendant. He or she can pursue her passion or his passion, be it in the arts, in economics, or even as a tradesman, we are now allowing ourselves to, to pursue what we want. And so, and so we have, we have the, the issue of false media, we have the issue of deep fakes, we have the issue of humans being humans. This has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. Whether or not the internet was there, human beings have always acted in malicious ways. Artificial intelligence does not change that fact. It provides an avenue, yes, but as, our co as my colleagues have said before, we are advocating for a use of artificial intelligence where regulations and policies and laws have been guided and they're guiding the use of artificial intelligence. And so we can stand now at the cusp of this development and speak about cynicism, we can speak about fear, but the truth is we are at the very frontier of human development. The opposition finally mentioned ironies and perhaps the most ironic thing here in this debate of artificial intelligence is that some are not <laughs> blessed with the human intelligence afforded to all. Thank you. I did tell you about opposition and government politics. You see it here, and you understand why it's in the parliament too. I want to thank the St. Lucia, well, Nisa for Lewis Community College for their contribution to the debate. Let's put a hand together for Nisa for Lewis Community College, and also on the other end, the Dominica State College is also Put our hand together for, for them as well. I want to thank you, the audience. I will now turn over to the Mistress of Ceremony because my duty has only been to moderate this debate or this boxing match in some instances. And I will turn over to the Mistress of Ceremony who will guide you through the rest of the proceedings until you have the unfortunate or fortunate pleasure, based on what side of the fence you're on, to hear me again. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our debaters again on debate one. We had incredible points from both sides, yes. So we will now have a 15 minute break and we will resume for debate two. And the topic is the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean 
is the prevalence of dehabilitated <laughs> families.
Are you looking to broaden your career opportunities? Future-proof your career with a bachelor's degree from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. We've introduced new cutting-edge degree programs in Environmental Studies and Sustainability, Tourism and Hospitality, Business Administration and Public Health. Online platforms are making it easier than ever before to further your education and mask your competitive advantage. This is the game changer you've been waiting for. Get the highest return on your investment in the OECS from the college you trust. Visit salcc.edu.lc. Apply today. The future is ever-changing. Communities, jobs, and economies are continually being transformed. This is why we need incredible minds to connect problems with innovative solutions, to disrupt and create new industries, to enable businesses to think sustainably, to shape evidence-based leaders and the next generation of visionaries. SALCC helps you to shape your career. Your passion is calling. Your future is standing by. Tap into your potential. Virtual and on-site classes, dedicated faculty, diverse student experiences, and highly recognized programs. So after Lewis Community College, apply today and fast track your career. Are you looking to broaden your career opportunities? Future-proof your career with a bachelor's degree from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. We've introduced new cutting-edge degree programs in Environmental Studies and Sustainability, Tourism and Hospitality, Business Administration and Public Health. Online platforms are making it easier than ever before to further your education and mask your competitive advantage. This is the game changer you've been waiting for. Get the highest return on your investment in the OECS from the college you trust. Visit salcc.edu.lc. Apply today. The future is ever-changing. Communities, jobs, and economies are continually being transformed. This is why we need incredible minds to connect problems with innovative solutions, to disrupt and create new industries, to enable businesses to think sustainably, to shape evidence-based leaders and the next generation of visionaries. SALCC helps you to shape your career. Your passion is calling. Your future is standing by. Tap into your potential. Virtual and on-site classes, dedicated faculty, diverse student experiences, and highly recognized programs. So after Lewis Community College, apply today and fast track your career.
The future is ever-changing. Communities, jobs, and economies are continually being transformed. This is why we need incredible minds to connect problems with innovative solutions, to disrupt and create new industries, to enable businesses to think sustainably, to shape evidence-based leaders and the next generation of visionaries. SALCC helps you to shape your career. Your passion is calling. Your future is standing by. Tap into your potential. Virtual and on-site classes, dedicated faculty, diverse student experiences, and highly recognized programs. So after Lewis Community College, apply today and fast-track your career. Are you looking to broaden your career opportunities? Future-proof your career with a bachelor's degree from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. We've introduced new cutting-edge degree programs in Environmental Studies and Sustainability, Tourism and Hospitality, Business Administration and Public Health. Online platforms are making it easier than ever before to further your education and mask your competitive advantage. This is the game changer you've been waiting for. Get the highest return on your investment in UECS from the college you trust. Visit salcc.edu.lc. Apply today.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me thank you for joining us, but also staying with us throughout what is a very riveting and long competition between the Dominica State College and the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. So the first, first debate has sort of ended, and the topic for the first debate was the benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the potential risk to humanity. Now, in preparation for this press conference, there are a few things that are very, very important that I must remind you of, which is very, very imperative. So the first thing I want you to congratulate by way of clapping Julian Alfred on the gold medal at the recently, well, the games haven't concluded, but congratulations, so we can clap for that. We could clap for Michael Joseph as well on the silver, yes. On the much better side, the West Indies women are also winning, so we could, we could clap for that as well. I will not accept any West Indies men slander here either, so if that's what you're looking for from me, don't, don't look for it. So also in Dominica, for all of you who are interested in traveling with your ID card, there will be West Indies men games in Dominica as well. So you can obviously get the ferry and your ID card ready because remember as part of the regional integration movement, you can travel within OECS countries within your ID card. So we're gonna go across to Dominica. It's not time for Creole Festival yet. So you can't go over there now and get ready until October. So we can, we can deal with that at a separate, at a separate time. Now, interestingly enough, you know how I was able to get all that information? Chat GBT. Yeah, is it? Yeah, yeah. Right, right there and then, you, you, you see where my bias lies, but again, that is, a, that is a show for a separate time. So, we're just about underway for the second debate, and I will not dispense with the formalities, but remind the incoming or new audience, online and in person, of our judges for this second debate. Mr. Lethan Khan is a graduate of the University of the West Indies Mona Campus, where he earned a bachelor's degree in management studies. He is professionally qualified as an associate of the Chartered Insurance Institutes of London and carries the title of the Chartered Insurance Practitioner. He also holds the title of Chartered Director from the Caribbean Governance Training Institute. He's currently actively retired for the past five years after a long career of over 33 years in the insurance sector across the Caribbean, including Jamaica and St. Lucia. Let's put our hands together and thank the active retiree, Mr. Khan, for his continued life of public service. You never truly retire, you just say BRB. Dr. Melissa Irvin is a linguist currently based in St. Lucia. Her research primarily lies in language variation and documentation. She also has a keen interest in language advocacy, and she has lectured at both undergraduate and postgraduate level, and is currently a freelancer and a consultant and an editor. I said it again, I will say it again. You know where to go for these services. She has also recently been involved in national language policy planning in St. Lucia, along with a number of cultural and linguistic projects. Let's put our hands together for Dr. Irvin. <laughs> Mr. Levy Harrell is an attorney at law with experience and specialist practice in company commercial banking, property, and litigation work. He has a passion for education and often advises on matters of education and the law. He has recently served or continues to serve on many boards, including being the chairman of the board of our alma mater. That sounds right, eh? That sounds quite, that quite the part, the St. Mary's College, also known as the Caribbean Laureate School, Mr. Levy Herald. Let's put our hands together. <laughs> and newly joining us, Replacing Ms. Tiana Forster is Ms. Lily Ching Soto. Welcome 
and thank you for being with us, who is a Costa Rican attorney who studied international relations and obtained her law degree at the University of Costa Rica and earned her master's degree in international human rights law at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. She has over 20 years experience at the Organization of American States, OAS, and she's currently the resident representative of the Organization of American States in St. Lucia. Let's welcome Ms. Soto as our new, our new judge. And last but by no means least, Mr. Jerry George is currently an adjunct instructor of media at the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. He has taught media and communication subjects for over 20 years at various institutions and levels in St. Lucia. He holds qualifications from the UWI, University of the West Indies Mona Campus, the City University of New York, and also the BBC Radio Production Training Center in London. He's a certified trainer through the University of the West Indies Cable Campus School of Business, and he is no stranger to debating competitions, public speaking engagement, and any interactions of which the media is a critical part. Let's welcome Mr. Jerry George. So there you have it, folks. You know who your adjudicators are. It is not a People's Choice Awards, I have you know. And there are qualified judges who are responsible for tallying and assessing competencies. Do not look inward for the result. Look outward. I beg. Again, the important points as part of this debate, as part of the rubric, the soundness of points, logical development, audibility and clarity, posture and personality, and command of material. When we're looking at the rebuttal, we're looking at team coordination, we're looking at general analysis of the debate, we're looking at recalling of points, we're looking at the ability to refute the points, and of course, spontaneity. Again, the participants of this debate from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, we have a new introduction. It's always interesting in our democracy how we don't swap the lower end of the parliamentarians, but then we just bring in new prime ministers all the time. And the first female prime minister from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College that now has formed the government, Miss Ashley Barnett. So let's welcome Miss Barnett to the debating stage. We've also brought in Mr. Dasha Jules as part of the debate. And of course, Mr. John Tench remains a standard bearer as part of the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College team. For the opposition, we have Miss Janice Corbett, who's also brought in. We have Megan Menz, who will be the seconder. I did not say Mendes. I was very, very, I was instructed quite at some time ago. And also the rebuttal being done by Miss Janice Corbett. So we have an all female team from the Dominica State College. So, folks, the topic for this second debate this afternoon is as follows that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. The key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. For the proposition team, we have the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, and the opposition team, we have the Dominica State College, who have remained in their seats respectively. The leader would speak for 10 minutes, the seconder, seven minutes, there'll be an intermission of five minutes for preparation for the rebuttal, and then the rebuttal will be for five minutes. After all that is done, this too shall end, and that will be the end of the second debate, but we're far off from there. Let's well join me in welcoming Miss Ashley Barnett, the leader of the proposing team. Good afternoon, my esteemed judges, my wonderful audience, and my worthy opponents. I bid you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Let's get into it. 
Families occupy an irreplaceable space within our Caribbean sphere. However, families and family structures are like overcome with debilitations that plague the very fabric of this Caribbean society. Present in every brazen beating by a drunk parent, every graveyard shift worked by a subdued mother is a debilitation plaguing our Caribbean society. In the slightest gaps created by the family's ineffectiveness, look predators of all kinds poised to devour the very future of the Caribbean. Mr. Moderator, judges, my worthy opponents and our esteemed audience, my colleagues and I, we firmly support the moot. The key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. Today, this proposition focuses on the pervasive phenomenon of gang culture. We are not concerned with the flaccid debate of which family structure is more harmful to society. Rather, we propose that each family structure is susceptible to debilitations which, which facilitate the flourishing of gang culture. It is imperative that this proposition establishes the ambit of its argument. And as stated prior, our examination of families will comprise all family types as they obtain within the Caribbean, be they nuclear, single parent, or extended. Furthermore, this argument accepts an internationally renowned definition of debilitated families by the Foundation for Post-Traumatic Healing and Complex Trauma Research as being a family that does not function within the normal parameters. It is also imperative we establish what is meant by the term key. As stated by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, the word key is defined as extremely or crucially important, not to be mistaken for exclusively or the sole reason for an occurrence. Accordingly, this proposition posits that debilitated families are in fact prevalent within the Caribbean. Jamaican Education Minister, Honorable Reverend Thomas Thwaite observes, weak family structure is a chronic disability within the Jamaican and by extension Caribbean society. It is a disability when you don't have a stable structure in the raising of a child. As a result of these debilitations, therefore, a gang culture exists and thrives within the Caribbean. Lynn Ann Williams in 2014, in her book, Liberian Gangs, defines gang culture as the norms, beliefs, values, and customs associated with a group of people, passed down from generation to generation, placing a specific value on eliminating oppression into that group through the use of social, legal, and political means deemed illegal or illegitimate. Williams at CARICOM Impact Summit in 2009 declared, Today, several of our CARICOM territories are experiencing substantial increases in their homicide rate. An analysis shows that much of that homicide problem can be attributed to gangs and gang crime. With these three central points, I can assure you it will become clear that debilitated families do in fact play a key role in gang culture. Firstly, gangs offer an avenue for children of impoverished families to make the money essential for survival. Secondly, the well-established hierarchies of gangs provide the structure children crave from their families. And finally, due to parental neglect and lack of supervision, Gangs provide a space of belonging for abandoned youth. Christian Barrow in 2008 argues that unemployment is a key contributor to po poverty in the Caribbean and that poverty is the biggest hazard to child development. Indeed, the financial limitations of families in the region cannot be understated. In the words of tens of thousands of Caribbean people, bagay mo ve ya, things are rough in the country. Irrespective of the family type, it is incumbent on families to provide for the financial and material needs of their members. This is a standard function. However, decades of intergenerational poverty, low paying jobs and unskilled labor have crippled the wallets of many parents. And caught in the crossfire are the children. The children who must watch as their parents struggle to provide for the basic necessities such as tools for school, groceries, clothes that fit, among several other things. 
This is when gangs rip the wrinkled family fabric. So it is only understandable that a child may feel an obligation to alleviate the financial struggles of their family by pursuing the economic opportunities of being in a gang. Me personally, when things looking real rough, a fast money sounding real nice. So gangs provide an opportunity for children of working class families to make money in a way that requires little to no formal education, no real skills, minimal commitment, but a huge payoff. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an understandably attractive prospect for young and old people in unfavorable situations. On to my next point, how do the well-established hierarchies of gangs provide the structure children crave? After conducting a research study, Dr. Stanton same now articulates that the gangs offer support, sustenance, acceptance, and a structure that the youngster lacks at home. Gangs offer a hierarchy of leadership and a path to gain approval and achieve, su achieve success. This structure is undoubtedly reminiscent of the power structure and roles of an efficiently functioning family. Two defining characteristics of a debilitated family are one, that family members feel unworthy, and that two, unpredictability and chaos prevail. Ladies and gentlemen, in, every near, in nearly every circumstance in which a debilitated family exists, the children are prone to feeling unloved, unappreciated, or even invisible. Pyrus and Sweet in 2015 found that numerous gang-involved youth came from single-parent households, with the mother often being the sole caretaker. This correlation may exist because the, parent, the mother is the only found the fa sorry, my bad, the family's only source of income and has less time to spend with the child. Additionally, low family involvement, poor communication, and low parental monitoring are all found to be risk factors of gang involvement. That being said, when a charismatic young man comes offering camaraderie and a place where you can feel like you belong, where your contributions are valued, the child has no choice but to succumb and join the gang. And finally, due to parental neglect, it is simply easy for a child to join a gang. In the words of prominent radio personality, Jukba, es usab ki kote tima mai uye? Do you know where your children are? In 2009, acting Prime Minister of Barbados, Frondel Stewart, expressed concern about the poor family structure in Barbados, observing that families of today are much weaker than they were 40 years ago. In 2023, these trends have only become more pronounced. Parental neglect makes it easy for a child to join a gang in several ways. Firstly, when parents are not actively involved in their children's lives or fail to provide proper guidance and support, young people may seek validation and belonging elsewhere. Secondly, without parental monitoring, youth may spend more time with their pairs and be more susceptible to peer pressure. If their pairs are involved in gang violence or delinquent activity, they may, they may feel compelled to join, to fit in, and to avoid isolation. Thirdly, Without strong parental figures, youth may look up to older gang members as role models, especially if they seem to have influence and power within the community. And finally, if a parent is not monitoring a child's actions, there's literally no barrier to entry. The child doesn't need to worry about being sneaky, they don't need to worry about moving carefully, because they don't need to worry about hiding their whereabouts because the parents would not realize in the first place. Moderators, judges, this is not an attack on Caribbean families. Rather, it is an audit of the deficiencies which plague them. These deficiencies allow the pseudo-familial gang to adopt into their embrace our promising future. In the words of our great Nobel laureate, Sir Derek Walcott, we issue a call to you to take a long look back. While this proposition understands the nuance associated with gang membership, we stand firm in the position that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is a result of debilitated families. I thank you.
Thank you very much, Miss Barnett. Let's put our hands together again for her. Folks, you'd forgive me, of course, for making the point that debates like these, with topics like these, are even more imperative now with our constant spate of gun violence within our country. And therefore, the country and the region must look to conversations like these for ideas, for solutions, for propositions, for oppositions as well, to debates like these so that we can chart a way forward. And I want you to really uh, congratulate the entire debate coordinating committee, but also for the framers of this particular topic for ensuring that debates like these are always reflective of the lived realities within, within our country. So with that, I want to also bring to the stage or ask you to join me in welcoming the opposition leader, Ms. Janice Corbett, who will oppose the moot, the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. I don't think the judges are ready as yet, Ms. Corbett, so we will just wait on them so that we could start. Remember that the leaders have 10 minutes to respond or to, to propose or oppose the respective moot. The seconder has seven minutes and the rebuttal will be for five minutes. Topics like these folks remind me of a famous song about the ghetto crying, which is a key feature of the Calypso, but I'm more particularly favoring one named Bruce Villeneuve. I'm not quite sure if you know it or if you know who sings it, but it's a very, very powerful song which has made its way to the finals of the Calypso Monarch, and we remember that we're there tomorrow night providing our Sumerian support to all who knows and who have family who have been to St. Mary's College. Judges, I'm obliged to you whether, you whether you're ready. Yes. So let's welcome with me Miss Janice Corbett, who will <laughs> oppose the moot as the leader. Two-year-old boy and grandmother savagely slain in Villefort. St. Lucia Loop News reported on April 9th, 2023. This incident occurred during the peak of St. Lucia's gang warfare a few months ago. It was just one of the many brutal murders during such a scary time. A time where gang activity reached an all-time high, a time where even an innocent two-year-old boy was not spared from such a brutality. Mr. Moderator, honorable judges, my most worthy opponents, my esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen of the audience and media professionals, a pleasant morning. My colleagues and I stand in absolute opposition to today's topic, which states that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is a prevalence of debilitated families. Allow me to define the key terms in today's topic. Key, according to synonym tech, means coming before all others in importance. Cambridge Dictionary defines the word prevalence as the fact that something is very common or happens often. And finally, debilitated, according to Collins Dictionary, means in a severely weakened state. Mr. Moderator, allow me to reiterate the moot based on the definitions I've provided. We are present here today to debate that the cause coming before all others in importance of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the commonly occurring, severely weakened state of families. It is my conviction and that of my colleagues that the debilitated family is a cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean, however, it is not the cause. I will substantiate this with the following points. First, economic crises have led to a gross lack of employment opportunities in at-risk minorities in youth and results in youth adopting the gang culture. 
Secondly, other fundamental institutions such as government, religion, and education have sorely failed to carry out their roles effectively. Honorable judges, in sociology, according to simplysociology.com, a social institution is a group or organization that has specific roles, norms, and expectations which functions to meet the social needs of society. The family, government, religion, education, and the economy are all examples of social institutions. The state of the economy is one of the most important institutions of society when we consider the development of gang culture. Mr. Moderator, when economies grow, they can tax revenue and gain the resources needed to provide the goods, public services that their citizens need. When economies experience crisis, however, there is instant financial chaos with increasing unemployment and poverty rates. One noteworthy recession experienced by the Caribbean was the Great Recession of 2008. During that time of extreme economic crisis, the Caribbean region experienced spikes in the amount of gang-associated murders according to a research paper entitled The Rise of Gang Violence in the Caribbean by researcher Sheldon Hill. My worthy opponents, the evidence is astoundingly clear on the direct correlation between the state of the economy and gang activity. Let me draw to your attention some compelling evidence showing this correlation in Jamaica from a research paper entitled The Rise of Gang Violence in the Caribbean. In the years of the Great Recession, the unemployment rate of Jamaica rose from 9.75 to 11.36%. Unemployment was generally higher among the youth age cohort of 15 to 24. Mr. Moderator, this is especially important since 71% of gang members are between the ages of 15 and 24, according to a 1996 National Youth Gang Survey conducted in America. It was also observed during the same time period that the percentage of gang-related murders in Jamaica reached as high as 50.5%. Mr. Moderator, in the age cohort 15 to 24 of low-skilled male youth, the at-risk minorities, the stark economic crisis we currently face in the region due to the COVID-19 pandemic is complicating the long-standing problem. The economy has likely pushed more young men into high-risk pursuits in, in, in the informal and the illegal sectors. My learned opponents, we cannot blame these numbers on debilitated families. How can we deny the fact that the status of the economy has a greater impact than the state of families in this mood? Having access to employment opportunities provides us with an escape the life of a debilitated family may promote. However, no employment opportunities due to a failing economy leaves us trapped with no alternative. Mr. Moderator, this is clear to everyone in the room. Debilitated families is a cause, but not the cause. Additionally, other fundamental institutions of society, government, religion, and education, have failed to effectively carry out their rules. The government is an institution entrusted, entrusted with making and enforcing the rules of a society, as well as regulating relationships with other societies. In a regional survey, including responses from Trinidad, Turks and Caicos, and St. Lucia, conducted by my debate team in June of this year, it was revealed to all that 83% of participants believe the action of law enforcement in their country is inadequate. The degree of consequence for a crime is not being met adequately by laws. Mr. Moderator, Due to a lack of sufficiently harsh penalties, repeat offenders are made into the at-risk youth. They adopt a mentality where they're not afraid to go to jail because it's considered par for the course in their communities. The jails themselves become gateways to gang initiation, Mr. Moderator. Honorable judges, let's take a look at another institution of society, religion. Religion provides rules and standards of behavior. 
Religious beliefs can influence the conduct of those who believe in them. But the main downfall of religion in the region is the fact that the church is unable to draw in regularly participating members and instill the religion's teachings in the youth. Catholic parish priest in Dominica, Father Francis, provided insight on the situation with the youth. Open quote. They do not feel enough motivation to come to church due to social media and what societal norms contribute. Close quote. My worthy opponents, the religion institution or society is weakening by the day by continuing to lose members by the dozens. So, a struggling economy, weak government systems, and for the coup de grace, a weak education system too, Yet, my worthy opponents want to make this just about the family? Mr. Moderator, the education system in the Caribbean has many shortcomings. The institution which encompasses schools is responsible for teaching values such as respect, discipline, and obedience. Children spend more time at school than they do at home during these formative years of their life. Children, when entering the system at the age of roughly two years old and graduating college at maybe around 18, 19, a good school system has the potential to shape us positively as young individuals. However, in the region, our system of education can be described as elitist. In some islands, such as Jamaica, the quality of education one receives is directly determined by their socioeconomic status, leaving the poorer children in schools offering a lower quality education. A case study conducted by Christopher Clark found that in Jamaica, dropout rates are forever increasing and without the values and morals that an education institution is supposed to instill, more and more youths are adopting the gang culture. Debilitated families is a cause, but not the cause. My colleagues and I remain resolute in our stance that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is not the prevalence of debilitated families. We firmly believe that the influence that debilitated families have alone on the youth is only minuscule in comparison to the impact the other four institutions of society have on the region. Ladies and gentlemen, my misled opponents, we cannot continue to place most of the blame and focus on debilitated families and remain completely oblivious to what's most pressing. Time is running out. The youth, the future of the region are at risk. I thank you. Mm -hmm. I have not checked my Fitbit, but I know I've covered a lot of steps for the day. <laughs> but that's good, because I said, in the absence of me jumping carnival, right, I might as well do my mega J to mega J up and down this room. But let's thank the Dominica State College and congratulate them again on a good presentation as the, the leader. We will in a very, very short moment, go to the seconders. I know that it has been a very, very long day, and the day has not ended as yet. So the seconder for the proposition being Mr. Dasha Jules, and also the seconder for the opposition being Ms. Megan Menz. So again, I would invite you to continue to jot down your points because during the breaks, as is customary, we will engage in just some thoughts and for some of you prayers on the, the debate moot and so that we could just share some ideas, not assessing the debaters, but of course assessing the particular points that were raised today. So once the judges have given me the all clear, then we will go ahead and invite Mr. Dasha Jules to the podium to make 
his substantive presentation. Yeah? It's interesting as well, because in my, well, I haven't judged much, but I don't know that I would be able to withstand or hold up to that amount of pressure of counting, counting these numbers. But there are a lot of accountants among that judging panel, because I would have had my chat GBT out asking it to add many, many numbers to me. And today is also Friday, I believe, Dominica State College, but today's Friday, right? So, Grizzly Friday night, tonight as well. Um, if you go all the way to the end, you could get some lobby and rice. Tell, tell them Rhyme sent you. It will only be $30, <laughs> which I believe is the same price that it would be without me sending you. Um, there's, also, there's also a lady who sells a plethora of things that you might enjoy. Um, lobster at times, crab if you're interested, snails and these things. So you could obviously patronize and stuff there as well. Um, and you could also enjoy the, the local music, I know. So I'll see you tonight. Just pick me up in Bexar. So judges, you ready? Mr. Dasha Jules, we invite you to the podium. Let's give him a round of applause. Good morning, Mr. Moderator, judges, fellow debaters, and members of the audience. Them no know when we are get chased by cops and the mag and the handgun drop. Lyrics from the song Family by Popcorn. I know this tune all too well, Mr. Moderator and judges. I am a teenage boy growing up in the Caribbean. I know the gang culture. I know the music. I know the gang wars. Just recently during a weekend of carnage, I was able to get all the information about what went down and what went wrong. I had the graphic images of victims in my phone minutes later. I heard about the mothers, the brothers, and the fathers who failed to protect, to provide camaraderie, to guide, to preserve the innocence of their sons and daughters, resulting in the loss of lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I frequently pass through a ghetto on my way to school, and I see the tough realities of the families who live there. And that is why I am convinced that it is the prevalence of debilitated families which fuel the pervasive gang culture in the Caribbean today. I have contemplated joining a gang to enjoy the glitz and glamour of gang life. However, fortunately for me, I belong to a strong and grounded family who, who, who encourages me to keep on the straight and narrow. That are on the straight and narrow. Mr. Moderator, I am in full support of my leader's argument that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. I will present two key arguments in that regard. One, too many of our parents are guilty of replacing the value of industry and hard work with materialism and entitlement in an effort to ensure that their children have a better quality of life than they had, and two, models of masculinity come not from the debilitated families, but they come from the glamorous gangs, due to the absence or marginality of males in the home. These two situations I will show result in young people being nurtured into a culture of gangsterism. When I have done so, you will no doubt be in full concurrence that it is the prevalence of debilitated families in the region that is the key cause of gang culture. You will be convinced that our debilitated Caribbean families fail to perform their, socio their social and economic functions adequately, leaving the youth susceptible to gang culture as they seek what they are, they are being deprived of in the home. Mr. Moderator, judges, let me quote yet again the Honorable Reverend Ronald Thwaites, a former Minister of Education in Jamaica, who asserted that weak family structure is a chronic disability within the Jamaican and, by extension, Caribbean society, end quote. According to the Honorable Ronald Thwaites, open quote, it is something so sensitive that we need to bring it into the open and deal with it, end quote. 
This prominent son of the Caribbean was in fact confirming the debilitated state of Caribbean families. Families are weaker now, and most of the values that were perpetuated when families were stronger have been lost as parents try to provide the things and the life they never themselves had. So in order to provide these children with all the important phones and jewelry and gaming devices, parents neglect the home. They are busy trying to make money and trying to make ends meet and inadvertently fail to pass to their children the values of industry, hard work that their parents had instilled in them when they were growing up. Their children therefore grew up craving quick money to sustain a life of glamour sustained by the gang. Additionally, because of the nature of the jobs and the amount of time the parents spend in the family is significantly reduced. Parents employed in hotels, for example, work split shifts and they hardly see their children. And wages may be so meager that parents could hardly afford food, much less the materialistic desires of their children. The Don, however, who is essentially the male community gang leader, can afford food and material goods. The problem, however, is that the gang provides these things through the use of social, legal, and political means deemed illegal or illegitimate. Hence, the state of criminality, immorality, and violence creeping the Caribbean today. Additionally, in debilitated families undergoing economic hardship, parents tend to condone criminality as long as it ameliorates economic hardship. This brings to mind the well-known Creole saying, si pani situes, pani vole. If there are no accomplices, there are no thieves. The need to escape economic hardship drives parents to hide the fact of their children's gang involvement as, as sufferers, they, in the words of the Calypsonian, the black Stalin, only want to hear where the next meal coming from. The next meal comes from the gang. Let us now turn our attention to the issue of modeling masculinity. I indicated earlier that in Caribbean families, models of masculinity come not from the families, but from the gangs due to the absence or marginality of males in the home. According to Sir George Ian Duncan Smith, a British politician and the head of Britain's Center for Social Justice, boys are turning to gang leaders and drug dealers for role models to replace absent fathers, and girls who have never known the empathetic, unconditional love of a father are left vulnerable, too early, unprotected, and often regretted sex, readily available in the gang. The same is true for the Caribbean, hence, Honorable Reverend Thwaites avouched the lack of a father in many homes must be viewed as a socioeconomic disability. A person who is disabled needs support. The gang offers support to persons incapacitated by the absence of a father in the home. In a study of ma the masculinities of gang violence in Latin America and the Caribbean, it was revealed that a respected man is closely associated with hegemonic masculinities, being strong, bringing home money, being a protector, having power, being respected, being a womanizer, a chauvinist, macho, brash. The gang facilitates all that. It protects male dignity. It is the last refuge of the poor. Families are the building blocks of society. Parents in debilitated families have replaced pertinent values with materialism and models of masculinity come from gangs. And if these issues are not resolved, our island paradise will be destroyed by gangs. Having presented my arguments, Mr. Moderator and judges, I am certain you can find no basis for disagreeing with me. Therefore, I thank you very much for lending me your aid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dasha Jules. Let's put our hands together again for Mr. Jules. A lot of lyrics have been tabled today in this debate. And lucky for me and lucky for you, I've not been blessed to sing, so I will not attempt to do so. And if I could, I would not be moderating this debate today because I will be preparing for my Soka Monarch finals tonight or my Calypso finals tomorrow. Some things are not learned, they're given at birth. 
and that one didn't come through. So I want to thank all of you again, and let's not forget as part of our spirited debate and conversation that we will have after, during our break, unless I think we go to lunch right away, I'm not sure what the, what the program is, then we will have these conversations and I will ask some very difficult questions of you based on the points that you've raised later as part of our analysis of the two topics. I don't like the terms devil's advocate, so I will not say that I am so. I will say critical advocate. And therefore, I will help you reflect on some of the thoughts as part of the debate. Once the judges are ready to go, we will have Miss Megan Menz to provide with us the second speech for the opposition. The future is ever-changing. Communities, jobs, and economies are continually being transformed. This is why we need incredible minds to connect problems with innovative solutions, to disrupt and create new industries, to enable businesses to think sustainably, to shape evidence-based leaders and the next generation of visionaries. SALCC helps you to shape your career. Your passion is calling. Your future is standing by. Tap into your potential. Virtual and on-site classes, dedicated faculty, diverse student experiences, and highly recognized programs. So Arthur Lewis Community College, apply today and fast track your career. Welcome. Good morning to the esteemed judges, to my cherished colleagues, and my most worthy opponents. My colleague and I stand here before you today to refute the moot that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. Before I present my points, allow me to elucidate a term necessary in order to fully understand my argument. F.H.M. Van Germit, assistant criminology professor at the Frey University in Amsterdam, in his book, Youth Group and Street Gangs in the Netherlands, defines a gang as any durable, street-oriented youth group whose involvement in illegal activity is part of their group identity. Similar to my colleague, I am of the firm belief that the prevalence of debilitated families is not the key cause of gang culture. This is simply because a number of roles, a number of other factors also play huge roles in precipitating gang culture in the Caribbean. These other key factors include the severity of peer pressure, the impact of foreign influence, and the absence of community and extended family support. Mr. Moderator, Honorable Judges, allow me to highlight a key cause of today's gang culture, peer pressure. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines peer pressure as a feeling one must do the same thing as others of one's age or social group in order to be liked or respected by them. Psychologist Eric Erickson proposed that adolescents face the identity versus identity confusion crisis. This is the task of determining their identity and role in society. It is at this time that adolescents begin to question things and break away from the things taught them growing up and begin to forge new identities. More often than not, adolescents look outside their family for this new identity and thus begin to copy the mannerisms and attitudes of their peers. Statistics from the non-profit risk management center show that the typical age range for an individual to join a gang is 12 to 24 years of age and the average age range for gang members is 17 to 18. Mr. Moderator, gangs are almost entirely made up of adolescents. An article titled, Adolescents are Wired for Peer Approval, from educationweek.org confirmed that adolescents will engage in any activity in order to gain the validation of their peers. This, coupled with the fact that youth are now reshaping themselves and developing new morals, make them the ideal targets for gang recruitment and the perfect molds for gangs to brainwash. Mr. Moderator, clearly peer pressure has proven to be one of the key causes of gang culture in the Caribbean. 
Secondly, the popularization of gang culture by foreign influences is much more monumental than you think. My worthy opponents, you cannot deny that the Caribbean is often exposed to a lot of practices and trends of the Western world, which trickle into aspects such as our music and public figures. Trinidad is a genre of music that originated in Trinidad and Tobago. It is a fusion of traditional Caribbean music, such as Calypso and Soca, with modern electronic music. Since its creation, Trinidad music has risen to fame among Caribbean youth. However, its upbeat rhythms are trumped by its violent messages. Take, for example, Skilly Bang. His music career gained traction after the release of his very popular song, Crocodile Teeth. I can assure you, Mr. Moderator, this song is not about staying in school and working hard for a good future. In an interview with Skilly Bang, he stated, and I quote, I have been setting a lot of great examples over the years, so I think I am a leader of the dance hall's younger generation with songs titled Bin Laden, Coke, and Badman, containing lyrics about selling cocaine and imitating the behavior of Bin Laden, a well-known terrorist, it begs the question, what are the great examples he claims to set? Unfortunately, the lyrics are not the most violent part of these songs. The music videos for these songs are filled with young black men carrying guns, doing drugs, and partaking in gang activities. It breaks my heart to say that foreign influence has affected our local artists too. In my own Dominica, young new artists are constantly trying to imitate the lyrics, lifestyle, and music videos of these regional artists who in turn are getting their inspiration from foreign artists. Mr. Moderator, when the youth of our country listen to music that empower them to join gangs and kill people because it makes them look cool, this is one of the key causes of gang culture in the Caribbean. My final point is that the absence of support provided by outside parties negatively impacts youth. Many are aware of the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Research article conducted by Rupert et al. It takes a village to raise a child. Understanding and expanding the concept of the village lists the villagers as siblings, extended family members, neighbors, teachers, community members, and policy makers. To get some local insight into this topic, an interview was conducted with Dr. Shani Schillingford, a Dominican educational and clinical psychologist with experience in family therapy. Dr. Schillingford revealed that no matter how small they are, the village and other figures in a child's life can have positive impact. Mr. Moderator, debilitated families have always been present. However, despite the state of the family, the villagers have always been present to push the child in the right direction. Gang culture is existent today not because there are more debilitated families, but simply because there is no village. In fact, there are a multitude of pe prominent people who are testimonies to the powers of the villagers. Take, for example, Keith Rowley, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. Rowley grew up with his grandparents as his mother worked on another island and his father was absent. Bayesian singer Rihanna grew up with a drug addict's father. Her father's addiction led to the divorce of her parents when she was just 14. These individual stories show that despite debilitated families, additional support is what is most important for the good upbringing of a child. Mr. Moderator, lack of additional support provided by the village is one of the key causes of gang culture in the Caribbean. In conclusion, all these factors I have just explained prove to hold significant weight. Peer pressure, foreign influence, and lack of additional support are undoubtedly key causes of gang culture in the Caribbean today. Thus, the statement, the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families, is sorely misguided and, quite frankly, absurd. Thank you. Thank you very much, D Dominica State College. I see Miss Christian shaking her head with a nod of approval. And believe you me, don't be fooled by that because Miss Christian gave me the nod of approval many years ago. That is meant to deceive and nothing else because I thought I had it and then the judges thought otherwise. 
Miss Christian looked at me in the first and second year and said, yes, my boy. And then the judges came back and said, no, my boy. <laughs> and they adjudicated Dominica State College the winner again and again. But you know how it is in the world of sport. So participants, you will take your five minutes for your rebuttal preparation, which is the final say that we will have today on this debate topic. So you will do your preparation, and then we will get into the rebuttal. Are you looking to broaden your career opportunities? Future-proof your career with a bachelor's degree from Nasa Arthur Lewis Community College. We've introduced new cutting-edge degree programs in Environmental Studies and Sustainability, Tourism and Hospitality, Business Administration and Public Health. Online platforms are making it easier than ever before to further your education and mask your competitive advantage. This is the game changer you've been waiting for. Get the highest return on your investment in UECS from the college you trust. Visit salcc.edu.lc. Apply today. The future is ever-changing. Communities, jobs, and economies are continually being transformed. This is why we need incredible minds to connect problems with innovative solutions, to disrupt and create new industries, to enable businesses to think sustainably, to shape evidence-based leaders and the next generation of visionaries. SALCC helps you to shape your career. Your passion is calling. Your future is standing by. Tap into your potential. Virtual and on-site classes, dedicated faculty, diverse student experiences, and highly recognized programs. Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. Apply today and fast track your career.
ladies and gentlemen, we're just about to recommence. I know you've had a long day. So, wait, as if a judge missing. <laughs> yeah. So, we will start as soon as Mr. Harold gets back. And we will start with the opposition. Rebuttal, Miss Janice Corbett, and then we will go for the government or the proposition to finish the debate. So Mr. Harrell is here. Let's welcome Miss Janice Corbett to deliver the opposition's rebuttal. Mr. Moderator, honorable judges, allow me to remind you and my worthy opponents of the evidence-based points my colleague and I brought forward today. The state of the economy, the failure of other institutions such as government, religion, and education, peer pressure, infiltration of foreign influence, and lack of the, fam of the village are all key causes of today's gang culture in the Caribbean, as opposed to my opponent's belief that the key cause is debilitated families. Mr. Moderator, my misled opponents have done themselves a disservice here today. For people of such intelligence, their points leave much to be desired. My opponents have failed to prove to my colleague and I that the key cause of the, the key cause of the gang culture today in the Caribbean is the prevalence of the family. We must not forget the importance of the word the in this mood. It isn't about a cause, it's the cause. Mr. Moderator, my opponent spoke of the all too familiar scenario of the single parent household with a mother that can't afford to maybe care for their child, bring, give them what they need, provide clothing that fits and groceries. And this family, more often than not, lacks a family figure. They claim that the child may be more inclined to join a gang in search of a father figure. Mr. Moderator, this is misleading. A ch you, um, honorable judges, do not allow my opponents to pull the wool over your eyes. You don't just wake up one day and decide to be an outlaw. I don't have a father in my family. In my family. Let me go and join a gang. This is preposterous. That child would turn to their peers seeking support. They could maybe turn to their education institution seeking guidance from a guidance counselor or a teacher that they respect. They could also turn to their parish priests in their communities and seek counsel, as well as they could turn to a village member, an elder in the village who they trust and respect greatly. The order that my opponents are trying to stress today is not realistic. Not at all are they realistic. You do not turn to a gang as your first choice. It is the failure of these institutions, the government, religion, education, and the economy that people turn to the gangs. What my opponents are suggesting is not the case. Mr. Moderator, my opponents also spoke of the poverty-ravaged family and parents who can't, like I said, afford groceries, put food on the table, as well as provide them with clothes that fits, and that these children may turn to an easy life of crime in order to make quick money. Mr. Moderator, it is the failure of the economy. It all dials back to the failure of the economy that leads to these people joining gangs. If the economy was in such a way that the standard of living was high enough where that mother didn't have to work two to three jobs and long hours to put food on the table for their child, they would be able to spend more time with their child and provide for them. Mr. Moderator, everything still dials back to the state of the economy. It is a failure of our economy which is leading to the poverty rates which we are all too familiar with today. You, my opponents, are focusing on the consequences rather than the cause. And with this narrative which you are trying to push, we will never be able to find solutions to this growing problem in the region. Finally, 
My opponents kept on stressing the importance of the family, the true impact that it has on the outcome of the youth. However, allow me to ask you, my opponents, where and how is the black sheep created? Explain to me that, my learned opponents. We see it all too often, a family which is quite stable, having children, maybe three, two of which are respectable, one is a delinquent. It is obviously the external factors that are turning that white sheep black. It is obviously not the influence of the family. Mr. Moderator, my own opponents today have stated themselves our points. They stated that the factors excluding the family are causing the gang culture that we see today. My colleagues and I, apparently, we didn't need to come here. Mr. Moderator, honorable judges, before I leave this podium here today, my colleague and I stand with an even stronger conviction that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is not the prevalence of debilitated families. I thank you. Oh. Another round of applause for, <laughs> for Miss Corbett. Yes, I will definitely remember this name at the end of today. <laughs> of course, to end the debate or the proceedings for us today will be none other than the finisher throughout the entire day, Mr. John Tench. But John, don't get up from your seat as yet because the judges are not done with their work. And of course, after we will engage in a very short conversation, we will not debate. We will speak to each other in very respectful tones and not use any sick language about mental fortitude or intellectual stimulation or these things. We will speak to each other about the moot before us today. You will share your thoughts, I will share mine, and then we'll go from there. Judges, you, you ready for us? Yes. So, Mr. John Tenge will end the, de the debate for us today. Let's put our hands together for Mr. Tenge. Good afternoon, good afternoon. I would like to thank the team from Dominica State College again for another thrilling debate. Uh, unfortunately, we have found many flaws within the argument. However, I would like to make one thing absolutely clear, and that is our proposition states one thing. Gangs weave their fingers into the humblest crevice found within debilitated families. And that is what we are arguing today. We are not suggesting by any means that other factors do not play a part in the proliferation of gang culture in the region. Rather, we are starting from the root, the family. For instance, the opposition would have you believe that the economy, the economy, the economy, and I would say that they're just a bunch of economists, really, but the family operates as the buffer for the economy. Good or bad, whatever the state of the economy, it takes a mother or father to hand to their child their last $20 bill and say, look, go to school. This is the difference between the points, their argument, and ours. We are arguing that the family is at the center of it all, and as my leader would have argued, uh, from Harold Lombus and Holborn, it is the family which is the primary instrument of socialization, especially within the region. So their point on the economy is well taken. However, it is the family which is instrumental, which, which, which takes what the economy gives them and raises a family regardless. We have the issue, as they have brought forward, of social institutions. We have churches, we have the governments, we have the education system. Yet again, we bring back the family. 
when we talk about church, who brings them to church? Who instills in them the morals of society? We are not just talking, ladies and gentlemen, about the family. We're talking about a debilitated family. The family which has its functions is the ideal family, however it exists in the region, yet the debilitated family cannot fulfill its functions. And so the, the passing down of morals, the, the instillment of values into its members, this is not being done. And so one may point and paint with a black brush the church, the school, the government, but at the end of the day, the children sleep under our roofs. Not the governments, not the prime ministers, but our roofs. And so we come now again to the point about peer pressure, peer pressure, and then we, we understand that they give statistics. The, the, the people, the majority of gangs are from 15 to 24. 15 to 24 year olds in the Caribbean live with their mothers. Simple, that is it. And so coming back to my seconders point. Si la pani sutiwez, la pani vole. If an individual is engaging in gang activity, he's doing it under his mother's roof. Where then is the corrective measure? Where is the mother to say and to put her feet down very rigorously? Where is the mother to give him five taps behind his head and say, here is the truth. This life will not pay you. This life is not rewarding. We are talking about, ladies and gentlemen, the family. And finally, it, it becomes a bit, a bit funny to me that they, the opposition rather, have missed our point. We are not arguing about single parent families or nuclear families or extended families. We are arguing about the family as it obtains in the Caribbean because the prompt says gang culture in the Caribbean today. And so a neighbor, an elder, grandmother, an aunt is part of the family. And so for the opposition to argue that there is a lack of village support is, is, is arguing in favor of us. That this structure is debilitated. The family as we know it today in the Caribbean suffers many debilitations. And so we are taking a look back as our leader would have argued and we're imploring perhaps a more forensic, a more inspective, introspective look of the family as a means of the gang culture today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for every single participant. So this is the end of the friendly debate between the Dominica State College on my right and the Sarafa Lewis Community College. I want you to again put your hands together for all the participants the organizers and of course to you the viewing audience online and in person judges will you be escorted out or are you staying within the the premises you're going yes so once the judges have demitted the facility we will engage in our very lively conversation and cocktails about this debate and we will not be slandering each other we will not be using any unnecessary wit but we will be engaging in a very serious and sober reflection on the topic before us so i want to thank the judges at this point for their stewardship ladies and gentlemen let's put our hands together for our judges Mr. Jerry George, Ms. Lily Ching Soto, Mr. Levy Herald, Dr. Melissa Irvin, and of course, Mr. Lethan Khan, and prior to who has left for other engagements, Ms. Tiana Foster. Thank you very much, judges, for your hard work today. We know that these headaches that you have are not easy ones, but they are necessary headaches to have in your line of work. I want to also thank 
our technical staff, the guys on the camera who've worked very, very hard. And being on the camera is no easy feat because you don't have the luxury of wanting to pee. Yeah? You don't have the luxury of wanting to use the bathroom at all. You have to withstand all of the, the pressures that obtain. So, again, as soon as the judges have left, we will engage in our conversations. And you could indicate to me which one of you want to go first because I know you have a lot of thoughts to share. And we're not sharing, not your, you know. <laughs> we will engage in that conversation. You all have thoughts to share too? Oh, gee. <laughs> so I would. Come. Yeah, so if you're making a, a presentation, well, not presentation, do come and give about 10 minutes speech. If you're coming to make an intervention, you will come to the podium to my left and you will direct the moderator, which is me. So you have to <laughs> sit in my there. <laughs> I just joke, okay, don't, don't do that. Um, but you will make your intervention over there. So we don't want to obviously skew anything that the judges are determining and tallying, so we will wait still. For them to for them to leave and believe you me this is but the most nerve-wracking time but also the happiest time that a debater could have because it signals two things one the end of it all but at the same time awaiting results that you've waited for for months Yes, so I will ask the debaters to go back to your team huddle. And again, thank you very much for your hard work. All right, so we can, we can sort of kickstart the discussion actually wait we supposed to we supposed to have another break Yes, so who's starting us off with the thoughts and reflections? Nobody? You're going to let me do it on my own? Anybody starting us off? Dennis, Sky? Anybody starting us off with any reflections on the debate? If you would, oh, all right, so we have Mr. Joseph coming to share some thoughts with us. So do I address you? Well, uh, no, the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, first of all, I'd like to commend the organizers of this debate. A really well put together. Questions very appropriate for this time. Very relevant topics. And I must say, I really enjoyed the level of debate. Uh, it proved that Persons are aware of what is happening on the ground, that they are personally impacted because some of the stories, well not stories, but some of the 
personal experiences were brought out in the debate. That persons were affected by it, but impacted them, and therefore they had a say. This is proving the point that many times we look to our quote-unquote leaders for direction, but it takes a multi-sectoral uh, approach to solving those problems. And it's interesting that somebody in a neighboring island would be aware of what's happening in our country and even able to cite statistics and even recent quotes from journalists, from business professionals, and also from incidents which have recently occurred. So it means that whatever is happening to us, and this was brought out very succinctly in the discussions about regional integration and the fact that we are one people and what happens to us in St. Lucia is very much um, reflected in the other countries as well. And that uh, having a myopic perspective uh, that it only affects me in that little ghetto or my community um, is far away from the approach that we should have. So I really want to commend you all. This last topic about the importance of the role of the family and by extension the role of the extended family, uh, the community as being uh, a very important factor in providing guidance for those who may have the temptations to be led astray or for those who are currently engaging in activities that do not um, support the lifestyles and the way of life that we traditionally have grown up to embrace. Really, really thought-provoking. And I think some of the salient points that have been brought um, out today, thought-provoking. And, and, and I would say that when you listen to both sides, you are fully persuaded. But then you hear a rebuttal and you're like, whoa. <laughs> Um, so, really, I do not want to say what side I think won for either of them, but I really want to commend you all on the level of discourse. And the Dominican team, I really want to say hats out to you all, um, you know, and, of course, the St. Lucian team. So, I look forward to this continuing, that this is not the first and last debate that we'll be having, but maybe the next time we have a debate of this nature, that we will have our colleagues from the other islands participating and that this will be a move towards the kind of regional integration that we have longed for. Because those two topics, and recently I have been on the media speaking about artificial intelligence and trying to raise public awareness of both the importance of the technology in terms of its advantages and its benefits and also the risks. And this will pose a, a tremendous challenge for us in answering some of the questions that we had in the second debate, um, the socioeconomic factors and the temptations, and at the same time understanding um, the antisocial behaviors that we already have and with things like AI coming, that our education system and some of the ways that we look at our value systems how we need to reassess them and prioritize them, and the way that we have these kinds of discussions that we go back to the family structure, but more so it, 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 it redoubts to personal responsibility and accountability. So I just thought I'd share those words, and I'm sure we'd get some more feedback from the other members as well. So great job, teams. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph. So. I want to ask the debaters whether, well, of course, it's sort of switch hats. And I know that obviously you've done this exercise in your mind to preempt and determine what the other side would say. But the first question being to the St. Lucian team for this topic, and you can be very frank with me, the judges are not there. Did you prefer being on this side of the topic or would you have preferred to be on the other side? 
No, you're allowed to come to see that. You come over and say yes or no. <laughs> well, come. Come and tell me what side you would have preferred, and then Dominica, you will, you will follow suit. Okay, I hope I, mm. don't, I hope I don't mess up what I say. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of this topic, obviously we were privy to it before. I can't say I was very involved in the, in the research and the meetings mm -hmm. surrounding that topic, but um, being privy to the topic, my immediate thought was, well, I couldn't even really decide. So that's what this debate sort of did. It, 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 was, it gave me perspective on both sides, whether it's family or, or other factors. And mm -hmm. I don't know what I came out thinking, um, which side. But I see it more rooted in family as a lot of the points that were I expected you see like that. They were, they were diverging from. <laughs> in terms of what side of the debate we'd have preferred to be on, well, I would have preferred to be on for this one. I'd have preferred to be on the opposition, not for, not for any specific reason, either than the fact that we were already proposing. So I was hoping there would be some opposite there we'd propose and they'd oppose and then they'd get a chance to propose and we'd get a chance to propose. Um, Oppose. Okay. But in terms of that topic, um, I think both teams did really well. Um, I happen to have a very short attention span, so <laughs> listening to people talk for long amounts of times is not easy for me. But I think both teams managed to keep my focus, especially the seconders on your team, as well as the rebuttals. I find the rebuttals were really well done, to the point that I cannot even say we, we won or... Okay. They, or we, or they all right. or anything like that. You see, so yeah. I think okay. both teams. <laughs> okay. I think I think both teams did really well, but I I don't uh, know. I feel like Raim already has his opinion yeah, because I, I know at the start. No, I just said, telling you that now your money expire on the call. <laughs> <laughs> because you you going into terrain uh, that might cost me my job. But, but go ahead. No, go ahead. But, but I feel like Raim said at the start, you know, this is only a friendly debate if it we is. lose, so I'll have to question that. You quoting me? You see that? That's why you must not say things in the crowd, you know. But thank you very much for that. Dominica, what side would you have preferred for, for the last topic? And why? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it doesn't matter. You could say, you could say either. Yeah, you could say either. It's fine. Well, first and foremost, normally I would just like to say, I, you know, I normally like to oppose anything mm -hmm. people propose because I feel like <laughs> everyone likes to propose things. So I was always, um, you know, I always felt comfortable opposing the, the benefits because when you really think about it, you know, AI really does have a lot of risks. Um, but of course, I'm not going to lie, me like, I'm sure a lot of people here love using things like ChatGBT. Not me. You know. You. <laughs> <laughs> well, almost everybody. So, so yeah, so, um, so yeah, of course, I'll, I'll never downplay the benefits of AI and all that. But yeah, um, yeah, I just, I just really wanted to propose, um, that's the side I preferred. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to oppose. If I oppose. Said, if I said so oppose, you would sorry. have. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. yeah so sometimes I. I would, I would be fit to oppose. Yeah, that's why, I th that's, why, that's why I think more. Yeah, but it, all right, thank you very much. I, I didn't expect the teams to weave much from their positions. It's really typical political party behavior. <laughs> yeah, they stick to the, stick to the script. Um, but all right, so any other, Omar has some thoughts. So Omar is a former <laughs> debate participant in the famous, infamous St. Lucia team of 2018, Omar? 18, 19? I can't, I can't right. remember. One of them. Well, hello, good afternoon, everyone. As Rhyme said, my name is Omar Combi, and I was one of the members of the inaugural St. Lucia debate team when WIDC first started back in 2017. Um, just want to say congrats to all of you all for a job well done. I love to see debating because I think it allows people to argue points in a way that is respectful and eloquent. I think oftentimes we get the kind of street vibes 
debates and arguments and we leave the more high-level stuff to politicians, to activists and stuff. But you guys showed we that. We leave that to politicians? <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you guys showed that this is something that anyone can do. That the, the conversation is accessible to everyone. And I remember a quote a man once told me, and it stuck with me for a while. He says, with Caribbean people, every Caribbean person is a philosopher. <laughs> and his point was that they have opinions. They think. Even when they don't say anything, there is a whole worldview or system behind that. But oftentimes, we, whether it be for peer pressure, whether it be for... The um, family. Fear, fear of criticism. The family. <laughs> <laughs> family dynamics, maybe. We do not raise our voice. We do not share our opinions. But having platforms like this are so important. And I think the debates also did something where it pointed to two important dynamics in our life. Technology and human interaction. And that's only going to become a more tenuous situation as time goes on as we develop more technologies as human beings deal with all the ethical solutions right now and my encouragement to you as debaters is don't let this remain only in, in the debating stage when you interact with your friends when you have the dynamics because arguments and disagreements always come up but allow the debating skills and the things you've developed here to edify those conversations because by doing that you create a more a society more open to different ideas a society more willing to share and with all the division and divisiveness that is often common in our culture your debating skills allow for common ground in places where people don't think so so don't take what you've done here today lightly again we all want to win for sure and kudos to whoever wins in the end but the skills you learn here matter for life because communication is the lifeblood of any relationship and we're serious if we want to if humanity wants to survive the next the next revolution our relationships are going to be key so kudos to all of you Omar I'm very happy that you're not going up in electoral politics, I'd vote for you. <laughs> but equally, if I was a judge, I wouldn't listen to anything you said beyond that. I would, you would win. <laughs> but, but what Omar says is important in a very real way, because your debating skills and purpose here is going to elevate conversations that you're going to have in the future. Your, your style and your own knowledge brings a more nuanced approach to issues and also a more intellectual approach to issues. So whatever conversation it is, you must bring that level of intellectualism as part of the debate. But even more than that, um, the, in relation to the point of the Caribbean individuals being philosophers, it, it, it's true. And it's true in a very real way, the sense that the Caribbean philosopher is distinct, separate, and apart from your traditional Western philosopher that is more abstract. So Bob Marley is a philosopher. They're engaging with the material in real time, and more so they're answering questions about everyday existence in different ways. So whether it be Asa Banton, who's answering questions about the society in musical ways. So it, it really is that, that engagement of individual and engagement of space um, among dance and music and cricket and culture these people are answering philosophical questions, but just framing their answers in non-philosophical ways. So it's these sort of things that we must always have at the forefront of our mind that, as I said, you add some level of intellectualism as part of all of your, your conversations in the future. So anybody else has any other thoughts on the debate? Shama, I will advise you to keep it brief to the point, come here, come, come, look at the mic over here. Before I have to take you off the stage myself. So, yes, Shema is also a former participant. Go ahead, Shema. Shema. <laughs> Let me. Yes, Shema was my president then. Sky, 
is your name. Go ahead. I know we have speaking similar we have similar speaking mannerisms, so you know I can get the confusion. You can forgive me for that. <laughs> no, I will. I want to say first of all, congratulations to the debaters. I can see the fruits of your loins. I can tell you put a lot of work into your speeches. And you didn't wake up yesterday and write and wrote the speech this morning. The only person I know who could do that is Rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say I am happy that we are, <laughs> we are continuing the, the steps towards regional integration and inviting other islands to have discourse with us. I can see you know, familiar faces from my previous, my previous um, escapades in debate. I can see some familiar faces from WIDC. <laughs> Hello, Trisha. How are you doing? <laughs> um, and also, I'm also proud to see some of my juniors from my time in secondary school also being champions of, this, of these steps towards regional integration and seeing my juniors up on the podium in front of a mic debating. Um, in regards to my reflections on the speech, um, one thing that struck out to me in particular is in regards to the topic of debilitating families and gang culture and something that both sides of the debate or the moots touched on was how multifaceted the problem is in regards to gang culture. And I think that is something that our policymakers need to keep in mind when addressing these problems and the public at large when it comes to thinking about these problems it's not just one aspect there are many institutions in society that contribute to the prevalence of gang culture in the caribbean and i just want to tip my hat to the debaters both sides for touching on it briefly in their speeches thank you very much for that I almost called you Shuma again, but I remembered. And you could come ahead. It's what Sky deliberately did not tell you was that the only reason I worked on speeches the night before the debate was because, well, <laughs> Chad GBT wasn't there. Right, at the moment it wasn't. But also that I became so emotionally invested which is always a bad sign for debating, mm -hmm. but a good sign for life. Sure. That I prepared a topic with all of my heart and soul, and, coffee. and it never came. <laughs> so you can imagine for me what that means year after year. And I had to sort of retire from the South Lewis Community College for fear that it happened for a third time. So in the first year, it was something about fixed terms for political leaders in the OECS. I was arguing in my heart and soul that fixed terms are an artificial creation or artificial breakaway with democracy, and that if people want you over, I, I don't forget you there, you know, Chief. Um, yeah, that's fine, that's fine. People, take your time, take your time. <laughs> and that if people <laughs> believe in you over and over and over again, as we've seen with my, my dear friend, in Dominica and in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, it means, and also more recently in Grenada, that the wheels of democracy will turn when the wheels of democracy decides to turn. That was my position then. I can't tell you what it is right now, but you get the general view. And of course we dipped, and that topic was nowhere to be found. <laughs> and the second year, it came again with an education topic, never came again. Instead, we got something about public-private partnerships that I could have barely defined. But that is the missing piece of Sky's story. You could go ahead now, sir. Right. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for these anecdotes, <laughs> you know, these stories, you know. <laughs> it's very interesting. And as a fellow debater, I can definitely relate to some of these instances where you just don't exactly end up with what you're looking for. And you work otherwise, you know. You, the key of a good debater is always spontaneity, and adaptability, I always say. And it's something that plays in every portion, every aspect of life, just your ability to be versatile on the spot. So that's definitely something that is treasured and should be 
partaken in every single debate, debater with us today. Um, good afternoon once again, everybody. Um, as we wrap up the end of our events today, I would just like to express my, my gratitude, honestly. My, I feel very humbled to be here um, in front of our audience members, some of which are familiar faces like uh, Johnny Schillingford, one of my longtime friends at the St. Mary's College. We reunite here. So, Ajani, how you reach? Where you reach here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story. Right. So. All right, Ajani. It's I, I forgive I forgive his betrayal, but yeah. that's all right. I don't. <laughs> but honestly, it is I am glad to see him here today, and along with his team, I'm always happy to see these new faces and potential debaters in our future society. Um, about my opinions on the topic, my bias holds with AI. I'm a STEM student, which means I particularly enjoy the sciences, the more analytical side of things. That's where my prejudice lies. But I do realize the importance of a family structure, of our society, the, so the social dynamics we hold between one another that allow us to even engage with one another right now. So although I do hold my biases with the first topic, I recognize the second's importance. If I had to say which side I'd like to be on, I definitely prefer proposition for, for, for the what? AI. Oh. For the AI topic. Right? Okay. My my opinions regarding the second topic, well, before I dive into that, I'd like to say it's it was a lot more convoluted. As we approached as a team, when we were trying to figure out which members should play what parts, where should we essentially place our members onto our teams. We looked at the first topic and it seemed clear cut. The benefits outweigh the potential risks. Bam, that's your exact argument that you're trying to prove or disprove. But with this one, it even faced other changes being made throughout its, its progression. So I definitely give my props to the, seconders, the second team who was able to tackle this argument and expertly perform. All right. Yeah, um, that essentially summarizes oh. my, my opinions on the topic. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So, you heard from him what side he prefers. Um, we still been looking after? I, I don't, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, I guess just general thoughts. So, in the latter topic, that's the one about the, the family. So, for the proposition, who did proposition? Oh, yes. So, after Louis Community College, um, I'm not making this a treatise on, on, on the performance. But just suffice it to say that it, 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 that side to me seems a bit, a, bit, a bit easier in the sense that you're sort of able to always, now the easier side isn't always the better side, eh? I'll get to that just now. You, it's sort of always easy to reroute everything back to the family. It's a very easy escape route. So you're sort of looking at the benefits of any family structure type and saying that whether it be single, whether it be extended, whether it be nuclear, all of these family types and structures have their own drawbacks. And therefore, when you look at these drawbacks, you could see a direct correlation with any element of which a gang can recruit, can find these shortcuts within a family. So single parents, let's say for argument's sake, they're not able to provide the financial basis for, that's needed for the family. Yeah? Yes, you could point to the economy, but then you could literally still reroute it back to the family and saying that the family is responsible for providing the financial basis, et cetera. Yeah, come, come, come up here, come. I, I know we're having a debate again. Yeah? So talk to me. Bring it down. Both of us have, uh, have short people problems. Yeah, it's it easy being us. But go ahead. I know we're not debating. Yeah, we all know. We, well, we are. But I... <laughs> all right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, go ahead. But mm. I feel like the same way you say you can route it back to the mm. family, you can also route it back to the economy because if the family is in an economy that is thriving, wouldn't it be easier for them to provide? Yeah, fair enough. And, and you're correct. But 
how I would have framed it is sort of making, not making the economy seem as an abstract element, but sort of making people or family or individuals the, the linchpin of, of the economy. That's just the approach that I would have utilized. So saying that the family is supposed to provide A, B, C, D, E, F. Right. Yeah, financial, social, psychological, whatever. And that in a single family, in a nuclear family, an extended family for argument's sake, all of these families have been deficient within the region because you have a parent who is working within the tourism industry that's not home, let's say single parent, not home, but child left off to their own demise, let's argue that. Then I could probably just create and concoct an argument for the nuclear family and say both parents working, so essentially the family structure or type is there, but the individuals within the family not present. So, yeah. mm, go ahead. Yeah, but at the same time, if the economy is stable enough, you wouldn't really need to be working long hours, so you wouldn't need to be away from your family. Agreed, granted. And, and you're correct. And that's what I'm saying. I would have just preferred this side because it's the easier. For me, I, I rather the easy in this instance. Um, I would have really just sort of make the argument in a, in, in a circular way. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about the, the, other, the other factors that cause... They, that, that caused gang influence. I think you all mentioned a lot about music. Yeah. But um, do you not, I'm asking you now, and I, I heard that you mentioned it, do you not think, obviously I do think you would agree with me, but fair enough, do you not believe that the two individuals that you've mentioned, Rihanna and Dr. Rowley, are just exceptions to the rule? No. And that there are a million individuals, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but that there are, that, that there are a million individuals across the region who have been susceptible to these external factors that cause, that cause them to turn to a life of crime. The same way you say that there are millions of other individuals who are susceptible is the same way I can say there are a number of individuals who have also made it despite their debilitated families. Yeah, and as so I said, yeah, I agree with you, but for my own purposes, if I was on the proposition that I really would have started the discourse saying, listen, the... The opposition has pointed to two superstars across the world. Right. But when you look down the road, you see 50 people who are not, who are not so fortunate, who did not have the family structure, and or, I don't want to say talent, because that makes people seem talentless, <coughs> but did not have the talent like Rihanna, and therefore, they can't even buy Fenty down the road. <laughs> you say superstars uh -huh. and uh, the only reason that they became quote unquote superstars is because they had the strength of you know their community to urge them along the right path if rihanna didn't have the extended community mm -hmm. she wouldn't have this she wouldn't have been encouraged to continue singing the same way if keith rowley didn't have his grandparents he wouldn't have decided you know what i want to be someone in society and he did that and keith rowley cannot sing so <laughs> And he may not be a superstar. Exactly. <laughs> so what about also you mentioned social media? Do you think that social media is now the primary mode of socialization as opposed to the family? Most definitely. So why? Why? Um, in our era, you know, it relates back to the whole AI thing. Our youth, we are a technological era. And because of that, we tend to go more to social media. And it doesn't even have to do with the family itself, but more of our pull to social media. I feel like the pull to that is stronger than the pull to our family. And because of that, we tend to gravitate more in that area. Why? I just feel like in Social media is some, we're easily entertained. Our generation are very easily entertained and we like things at our fingertips because technology was supposed to make life easier and we've had that easy life. And so why would we want to deviate from the easy life that technology has created? That's what pulls us to social media. Easiness, facilitating our happiness, which is cat videos and everything else. <laughs> Now, I'll get right. back to you just now. Let Mr. Harold give some three months. I'm I very sorry to interrupt the, the debate, but um, I'm leaving now, but I, so I, I wouldn't get the opportunity just to, first of all, to congratulate you for um, a very interesting and engaging uh, two debates. I also want to, to thank you 
um, the whole Dominican team for coming to St. Lucia. Uh, I wish that we did this a lot more often and that um, whether the transportation between our countries was such that we were able to do this every week. You know, we are indeed the Caribbean people and um, I certainly share the view that we will reach our zenith when we can integrate a lot more um, intimately. Okay? Um, I'm very pleased that um, the, the young Sumerian, Yaim um, Rahim, is doing so well. He, I think he's done a fantastic job. And, um, you know, I'm very proud of him and, and um, the work that he's doing. You know. um, he's looking very dapper today with his um, suit and carrying the part. So, um, I'm, so have a very good rest of the weekend and um, all the best and congratulations to the winners. Okay? Yeah, so right back where we were. So yeah, I'll come to you, Mr. Mr. Joseph. So I mean, I equally already in, in relation to the social media, again, I would have already found the easy rerouting mechanism and say that, listen, the regulation of family is meant to regulate behavior. Yeah. So if it is that children are spending 24 hours on the phone, it's because the family has not found the best mechanisms to regulate that behavior. So the influences are stronger on someone, hypothetically, who spends 24 hours on their phone doing a particular thing than within a regulated environment of the family that, that, that sort of allows you to use it, use it more sparingly um, as, opposed to, as opposed to a free for all. So, uh -huh. That would be ideal if you spend all your time with your family. But as my colleague said, you spend a majority, youth spend a majority of their time in school. Based on what years? Based when you go to school. But what about the formative years? No, but we were talking mm. specifically about social media among adolescents, ah, youth. So you're now ready to do Yeah, you, yeah. That? And we'll those adolescents, <laughs> youth, they go to school. Mm -hmm. And so, as someone who is also easily distracted, um, when I went to school and I had to use a tablet for school, I can guarantee you I was not paying attention to my teacher. And that's just because everything is online. So whether or not my parents regulated it at home for the measly hours at home, when I'm at school for eight plus hours in a week, that's nothing compared to the regulation that could happen at home. Okay. When the mice, are, when the cat and the mice play and the mice are me, and mm -hmm. the cats are my parents, and uh, you know, you get the analogy. Yeah, but, but you, you, didn't, you didn't roll in a gang, did you? Yeah, well, you see, I'm not <laughs> from a debilitated family, and ah. I had the community. Ah. <laughs> and I had- Suddenly we walk into the trap, eh? No, that was no, well no. said, that was you well said, eh? You didn't let me finish. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I had, I have, uh, the support of my extended family members. I have my siblings. I have my grandpa. Family, I have the church. Family. That's your family. But but I get you. I get you. I get you. I get you. So I, I as I said, I would have. I wouldn't say that. I would say that I brought that up because our points were that because there is no people like that around. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have people like that around, I probably would be in a gang. I feel like I would join a gang if I was listening to the music that I listen to constantly and mm -hmm. I didn't have my extended family support. It'll make support. you feel bad. Huh? It'll make you feel bad. Yeah, of course, 100%. <laughs> if, if I had a gun mm. and I would... I'm not incriminating myself, I promise. <laughs> um, if I had a gun and uh. I did not have my extended family support and mm. my friends were like terrible people encouraging me to join gangs, I probably would be in a gang. But I don't have that and that is Fair why... Fair enough. Anybody else have any other any other thoughts? A question I want to ask. Ah, uh, yeah. you mean you mean Domin? Yeah. yeah. No, somebody else want to say it. Uh, you could you could ask the question. Yeah. Oh, your topic. Yeah. Oh, your topic. Children are the white sheep, and then you have a black sheep. 
Yes. What causes the black skin? Where's uh, because if we, if we, where, at what at what point do we um, start to attribute it to personal responsibility to influence and all that? How was the parent able to have influence on extended family have influence on the two and not on that one person? What caused that one person to be a black sheep? So that is the question. Okay. That's the problem with the black sheep scenario. Because we often, like I said, have families, let's say they're very stable, both parents are working, they're both active, and two of the three children are respectable and one just becomes a delinquent. So the point I'm trying to prove with this example is the fact that it's the outside influence and surely not the influence of the family because this family is not debilitated by definition Nothing is working against the family as a single unit. So it's the outside external factors that's influencing the decisions of this, of this one child and makes them turn wayward or turn to delinquent activities. But, but you agree with me that the actions of that one child has uh, a tremendous on the family structure. It can, yes. How do we, how do we, how do we define debilitating? How, how, do we, how do we define it? Because sometimes you look at families, and I know personal examples. They are family. Yes. They look perfect. And you wish you would be them. Mm -hmm. But when you start going internally and you start or what happens behind closed doors? It's not the exact same as what we perceive from outside. So, so some. Sometimes, even among young boys mm -hmm. who don't come out and are not vocal about the things that are affecting them, or maybe even young girls yes. who would come out and tell you, look, I'm hiding something, or I have those, I have those, I have those, mm -hmm. I'm being molested, anybody. Yes. And as a mm -hmm. Yes. So, so there are so many, yeah. There are many factors that we don't see in terms of what we, how we define um, as debilitating, yes. right? Um, how do we define it? Is it the emotional um, component, what we see on the outside? Um, is it, what, what defines it? The reason why I say that is as a community leader during the pandemic, I had to redefine who uh, the persons who I felt needed assistance. Yes. That these were like the poor people on the streets, mm -hmm. but then the person at Cap Estate who's driving a Mercedes or a BMW, I didn't think they needed help. But they are the ones who needed help but would not cry out, right? Yes. So that's my question. Okay. How do we define that? Oh, you, oh, oh, you can say something first. I feel like a lot of what you spoke of entailed of like the financial factors of the family structure, but we could also look at it from a perspective of not only is the family financially stable, but they are loving and they have a good structure. And as my colleague said, whereas the child may have a good foundation at home, when they are exposed to other factors, when they spend time at school, it's these factors that help to shape them into being the delinquent or the black sheep of the family. And uh, when defining what may be a debilitated family, because you gave the example that you may think that a family is the perfect or the model family in a community, but they're actually not. However, we are not saying, we're, we're looking at the ideal. We're looking at what is actually the case. So we're not saying that the perfect family is going to include people, like you said, that may not actually be loving, like my colleague said. We're talking about the actual family that is loving, can provide for their children, is actually genuinely stable. So we are not referring to the, the full perfect family, we're referring to the actual family. So that is something that we have to look for, or look more into as, like you said, leaders, because some families may seem to be the model families, but they're not actually 
but this has not this is not what we are talking about we're talking about actual families that are genuine in their actions and intent mm -hmm. all right ladies thank you everyone for your intervention <laughs> ladies and gentlemen this is the end of the friendly debate between the Dominica State College and the South Fulwis Community College. We saw two riveting debates, one on artificial intelligence and the other on the gang culture and the possibility of existence of debilitated fa families. I want to thank you online audience for viewing into this intellectually stimulating debate. And as I've said in the beginning, these debates are important because they shape and frame conversations within our society. And it shows that even amidst the doom and gloom of some pundits among or against young people, that there are young people among the general cohort of young people that are spending time actively wrestling with real issues within the society. So I thank you for joining us online, and we will inform you in a different way of the results on the online platform. Thank you. We call Mr. George Fuss. Yeah, we call Mr. George Fuss, right? Online audience, lucky for you, you will see the results in real time. There was an error on my part earlier informing you that you may have received the results via a mailbox near you. But suffice it to say, we used AI. We used AI. <laughs> 
and Ch chat GBT asked how fast can we get the result? What is the best way to transmit results to an online audience? And it told me Facebook. So lucky for me, I, I have that. But I want to invite Mr. Jerry George, who will provide some feedback to the debaters based on behalf of the judging panel. Mr. George. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you to the teams. Dominica, welcome to St. Lucia. We greatly appreciate it. The fact is I've been to Dominica over nine times. Um, at one time, I, I performed the, the task of a recruitment advisor for a, a college that was looking for students um, to attend college here in, in St. Lucia. Very beautiful country, and people are very, very warm. But tell the government do something about the confusion of the city. The traffic is horrendous. <laughs> so, Nusha have traffic problems? Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just say you did not use the right route. <laughs> you did not use the right route. <laughs> but we're happy to have you here, and I'm so happy that Sir Arthur Lewis Community College took the opportunity and ran with it, and I'm so grateful to have you here to participate. In the judges' chambers, we really needed a referee because it was very close on almost every count. Yes, very, very close. And you see they've all abandoned me now. I'm here to face the firing squad. <laughs> oh, Mr. Khan is still here. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for supporting me. Well, my comments will be very, very few in the sense that, um, as I said, the box were very close, which reflected, I think, the fact that you put a lot of preparation into this um, debate. Um, the, the level of the research that was presented there, you know, had us scrambling also to write notes that maybe we should check that at another time. So I want to congratulate the teams for the effort that they have put into, into doing this. Um, in terms of criticism, there isn't really um, anything that we can say to you simply because every judge has their own approach as to how a particular topic should be covered and that was part of our discussion. But when you come down to judging, it's not your approach but what has been presented to you that has to be judged, right? And once we've put our biases aside and said, okay, this is what the, 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 the teams have presented, then let's look at it you know, for what it is. And um, I can tell you that <laughs> without any further ado, whoever is going to announce the scores, just let me know when so I'll be out of the door uh, quicker, quicker than anything else. But we, we did our best. We did our best in, in terms of reflecting, I think, the, um, the level of input that you have placed into these very, very, um, how would I say, challenging subjects, very challenging. One of the th points that was, I think that is worth mentioning is the fact that a lot of emphasis was placed on Jamaica in terms of you know, uh, presenting the family and gun, gun violence. And considering that it is, a t it is an area that is touching almost every Caribbean country in some form or fashion, we should look for some sort of um, um, research um, different to what obtains in Jamaica and to reflect what is happening around the Caribbean. You know, and we didn't want to be up here to be picking, but in any case, when we talk about research, this is a, an area that is um, of, 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 uh, of limits here in the Caribbean. I'm sure if you were to try to find information about gun violence in Dominica, it will come up like zero. And the same would happen for St. Lucia. Um, unless you are going to do your, do your own. 
But for a debate, going the extra mile is worth it. Yes, and um, that's what I can say. Give your hand, uh, your, yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Every team member is worthy of note at this um, debate. And I just want to say thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you for being part of our weekend, which Mr. Where's the moderator? Oh, there he is. <laughs> Has agreed to, to treat you to the, you know, the best of accommodations and hospitality in St. Lucia. So <laughs> remember to take, up, take him up on, on his word. Don't let him get away. <laughs> so again, thanks for coming to St. Lucia. And thanks for being part of this. And I just wish that we can go back to the four con countries format the next time around. Congratulations to the winners and congratulations to everybody who participated because everybody is worth every point that is given to your team. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. George. Don't go away as yet. We have a small token of appreciation from the organizers of the competition for mr jim joseph as well can you come to just take your token of appreciation I've only got one. yes <laughs> and for what and for what you and for mr joseph yes You're, you're looking in front here. <laughs> so we will now call out the participants for your certificates of participation in this esteemed friendly debate. And oh, how I love this moment. The one where I get to decide when the results are being called. I'm always at the receiving end of the nerve-wracking experience. So we will call on Mr. Daniel Ajani Schillingford from the Dominica State College. <laughs> Khalil Stout, Dominica State College. Alicia Desiree, Desiree from the Dominica State College. <laughs> Sasha Maxwell, Dominica State College. <laughs> Janice Corbett, the Dominica State College. and Megan Menz from the Dominica State College. From the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College, Ryan King, Rinkage King. Rinkage King, yes. <laughs> Ashley Barnett, South Lewis Community College. <laughs> Dasha Jules, South Lewis Community College. Jaden LeBron, Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. John Tench, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College.
So, the moment we've all been waiting for. But before we go there, <laughs> oh Lord, how pleased I am. I, I think they need to invite me to future events like this just for that part so that I could look you in your eyes and delay. But on a very serious note, we are very pleased, as the judges mentioned, with the display of talent we saw today, the intellectual rigor, the hard work that was exemplified through the prepared speeches, the planned and off-the-cuff rebuttals at times, the general modus operandi of this debate, and therefore, as is said in these competitions, everyone can be proud of themselves but because of their very existence as part of this competition of course within these competitions within the confined rules there are what we call winners and what we call those who've come second place <laughs> and following in the true tradition of sport i have to declare the winners of the two debates the overall winner, and the best speakers. In the first debate we saw this morning on the topic of the benefits of artificial intelligence outweighing the potential risk to humanity, the Dominica State College received, received 1,015 points. And the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College received 1,104 points. <laughs> the winner, therefore, of the first debate is the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. <laughs> we will ask the members of the team I guess if you want to bring the staff, if you want to bring your parents, your cousins, your nene, and your pawe, now is the time. And now we have the best speaker from that debate. The best speaker prize is the one given to the most articulate, among other superlatives, within a particular debate. The best speaker for the first debate is Mr. John Tench <laughs> from the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College. And the second debate, which was that the key cause of today's gang culture in the Caribbean is the prevalence of debilitated families. When I debated <laughs> many moons ago, I sat right where you were with my team, well, our team rather, in a, in, in a semicircle, with our eyes closed in the very same manner that your eyes probably want to be closed right now. As we waited for the judges to declare the winner on Venezuela, something about Venezuela's, the need for CARICOM to address the economic morass in Venezuela. Suffice it to say, we cried after the results were called. You've, you've figured the rest of the story for yourself. In this debate, the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College received 1,032 points. You have to clap. <laughs> and the Dominica State College received 1,100. 
and 54 points. And the winner of this debate is the Dominica State College. Yes, Miss Christian has been in this fortress of victory for a very long time. <laughs> and the best speaker for that debate is Mr. John Tench. <laughs> now John, in the interest of reducing our financial handicap In the interest of reducing our financial burden, you will re bring these two trophies back, and I will write on one trophy that you got best speaker for two debates. Yeah? <laughs> but we can work out the logistics after. You can take your pictures first. But every cent is important, especially if we want to reduce the prevalence of gang culture. Yeah. No, we have many facets to look at, right? Right, men men's? men's? We need to look at the social media, technology, everywhere. So, before the overall winner, tell we have for some time, the Dominica State College, and by extension, the country of Dominica, the nature isle of the Caribbean, and the country which is poised to be the first climate resilient country within the world, has a few tokens for their St. Lucian counterparts. So, they come bearing gifts, Love and sometimes licks. So, you just, yes, so one by one, I will call you. Yes, so let's do artificial intelligence teams first. Yeah? So, all those from the Sava team who are part of the artificial intelligence stand so that the tokens will be brought across to you and then. The same will be done. So, this are, oh, you gave it already? Yes, so, this, yes, so, Dominica State College also has some gifts to the gang culture team, and my best bet is that it has a map of all of the things that causes the gang culture. One part is the family, but it has many other things mm -hmm. as part of it. So accept the gift with caution. <laughs> and now the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College Wait, they, you all give it already? Hmm. This is Alpha Lewis Community College. Gang culture team now has the... 
Yes. Just do a swapping over there. To the, to the, yes. They can get it after? Yeah, okay, okay. good for them. <laughs> for sure. Yes. And if you look in your bags, Dominica State College, you will see a few tickets to the events happening next week. But you won't be there though, so you could hand them all back to me. So, and John, at the bottom of the bag has a free ticket for Dominica Creole Festival. <laughs> a written one. So, now, the moment, again, that you've all been waiting for, the last time that you hear my voice for the day, the overall winner of the friendly debate competition between the Sarfa Lewis Community College and the Dominica State College, and obviously, if you were infused within AI as I am, you would have tabulated the results yourself with ChatGBT when I call them out. But for those who opposed AI, I'm certain that you used the calculator. Uh. The Safa Lewis Community College scored 2,136 points. <laughs> A round of applause. And the Dominica State College scored 2,100, drum roll, 2,100 and 2,100. Hyphen N I N E M I N U L. I'm just joking. 2,169 points, and the overall winner of the competition is the Dominica State College. Yes. Okay, perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been my absolute pleasure. As you realized a while ago, I didn't have ChatGBT to do the minus for me. I relied on my human instinct. But I will now invite the president of the debate societies of the South Lewis Community College and the Dominica State College to give the vote of thanks, which will be the last say for the day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So you all will determine which one. <laughs> Who goes? Mr. Schillingford, I guess. We'll go, we'll go first. Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. We thank you all for coming here this afternoon and morning to celebrate and commemorate this event. We, the presidents of the Debate Society, would now like to take a special moment of gratitude for all the various factors that came into play to making this event a successful one. Good afternoon, everyone. 
I would like to thank everyone who has put in, you know, their efforts into making this event a very formidable one. Um, I'd like to extend thanks to both the Dominica State College and Sir Afa Lewis for granting us this opportunity to build our proficiencies in debating, critical thinking, public speaking, and, you know, of course, being able to network with other neighboring islands. We are very grateful for this platform that the respective schools are provided for young students like ourselves to step up and really speak on behalf of our opinions, on behalf of our families, on behalf of our schools and our nations. First off, I would like to give a special thanks to the sponsors who made sure that all the luxuries that we've enjoyed, all the conveniences that we've been brought with, that they are here with us today. The sponsors being the Big Edge Financial Express, Morrow and Company, Doasco, Jolly's Pharmacy, Gabriel J. Christian and Associates Limited, Joel Challenger, the staff of the UE Open Campus, former members of the Dominica State, Colle State College Literacy and Debating Society alumni. These instrumental, these instrumental sponsors made many of the conveniences, as I've mentioned, possible today, such as the food that I'm sure all of you have enjoyed, the water, the refreshments, seating arrangements, and um, in this very moment, I'd also like to ex extend a great appreciation for the camera crew and the media personnel who helped capture every single moment, every single breathtaking, contentious, informative moments that we were brought here today. Also, I would like to extend thanks to our sponsors who, as you know, helped us into being able to even come here. So I would just like to make mention of them. Morrow and Company, Big Edge Financial Express, Dowasco, Gabriel, Gabriel Christian and Associates LLC, Joel Challenger and former members of the DSC Literary and Debating Society. In addition to these sponsors, I would like to thank all the various debaters who took part and made many sacrifices to be here today. Their time, efforts shall be appreciated. We have various members of both sides, namely myself, Rinkage King, Dasha Jules, Ashley Barnett, John Tench, and um, of course, we can't forget our um, debate mentors that also assisted us in preparing these countless debates. Such mentors like Ms. Lorimer Jacobs, Omar, Omar Combi, right, Ryan Mogis, Jim, Doc, Mr. Jim Joseph, who, who, ex, who presented as a formidable um, factor pushing us forward in the AI topic, particularly because of his expertise. I would like to thank my team and advisor for making this experience a very formidable one, namely myself, Janice Corbett, Megan Menz, Sasha Maxwell, Khalil Stout, Bijou Desiree, and our advisor, Trudy Christian. And also putting forward you know, this initiative because you know we were robbed off the Windward Island debating competition. <laughs> but uh, thank you for pushing this initiative forward and giving us you know, this opportunity to still be able to, you know, expound or build our public speaking, our networking. So thanks a lot. Right. Last but not least, uh, we would like to thank the judges who also, in some cases, last minute um, instances, took their time to travel here and to perform their duties as judges. Namely, we had Ms. Tiana Foster, who assisted us with the first AI topic. Mr. Jerry George, who presented our results. Ms. Melissa Irvin. Mr. Lifon Khan. Mr. Levi Harrell. And Ms. Lily Sheng Soto. We thank you. Okay, and finally, I would like to thank the Sir Arthur Lewis Community College for putting together, you know, such a, a good event. You know, it was well done. And, uh, you know, thank you for helping us in giving us, you know, that opportunity 
to be able to do this. So thanks a lot. Thanks. It was a great experience.